Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MICTA Academic Dialogue in 2020. We are coming to you from Seoul, Korea, and streaming live on YouTube. In this webinar, there will be experts from the MICTA countries, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia. My name is Youngwan Kim. I'm a professor at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. I will preside over the dialogue today. The MICTA Academic Dialogue is organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea with a theme of post-COVID-19 global orders and MICTA's role as a middle power partnership. We will have two sessions and in-depth panel discussions with MICTA leaders and experts. As you may know, South Korea is a chair country of the MICTA in 2020. Teo Lee, the vice minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in South Korea, sent us his opening remarks. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. It is great pleasure to open the 2020 MICTA Academic Dialogue. I warmly welcome the distinguished experts and scholars from MICTA member states. I find it regrettable, though, to be unable to meet you in person, but I appreciate your being with us despite the time differences. MICTA, launched in 2013, has indeed firmly established its place as a new partnership of middle powers spanning various regions. In less than seven years, MICTA has accumulated an impressive track record. 17 foreign ministers' meetings, five parliamentary speakers' consultations, and more than 70 joint statements issued on many occasions regarding a variety of global issues. Nine months into the COVID-19 pandemic, which is impacting almost every single aspect of our lives. The world is going through further exacerbated challenges that reveal the vulnerabilities in the global governance system. Under these circumstances, each of us should remain separated physically, but unless we unite in our fight against coronavirus, we will all fall to it. The spirit of global unity, solidarity, and cooperation is now called for more keenly than ever before in the ongoing great war of the humanity against this pandemic and for global health security. I believe that it is precisely during this unprecedented time of a global crisis that middle power countries such as MICTA should step forward to further boost multilateral cooperation. It is all the more so because we are all great beneficiaries and strong supporters of multilateralism. Furthermore, I believe MICTA, as an innovative, consultative platform, can serve as a driving force for bolstering multilateralism and mastering our efforts to give real effect to it. Indeed, our five countries have remained firmly committed to drumming up multilateralism all the way since the outbreak of the COVID-19. We have all been at forefront together and individually in galvanizing the multilateral response to COVID-19. Collectively, our five countries adopted a ministerial joint statement on COVID-19 and global health in April. In the joint statement, we expressed our solidarity as a group on the global journey towards overcoming the pandemic and building a more resilient future and emphasize the crucial role of relevant international organizations, in particular the WHO. In July, the MICTA foreign ministers virtually met for the first ever MICTA ministerial video conference. They underscored in one voice the urgent need to strengthen multilateralism amid the current COVID-19 situation and agreed to further step up collaboration among the MICTA member countries 
on the multilateral stage, including the United Nations. For each part, Korea took the lead in launching a series of friends groups in an effort to promote action-oriented collaboration under the umbrella of the global health architecture. In New York, Geneva, and Paris, Korea is pushing ahead, together with other friends, with the causes of solidarity for global health security, global infectious disease response, and inclusion with global citizenship education. In line with this spirit, having assumed the chairmanship of MICTA this year, Korea thought it would be appropriate for this academic seminar to focus on a theme of post-COVID-19 global orders and MICTA's role as a middle power partnership. I'm confident that this seminar today will indeed provide a meaningful opportunity for you who are from all MICTA member states to share views on ways to take MICTA forward with the goal of contributing to strengthening multilateralism in the midst of a global health crisis. And I also believe that this seminar will generate valuable momentum for revitalizing academic exchanges among member states of MICTA. Given that a seminar of similar kind was held three years ago. Once again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the participants. You reflect, real indeed, so well, MICTA's diversity and dynamism. And I very much look forward to fruitful and lively discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Lee. Next, there will be a welcoming remarks by Sang Hwan Lee, the President of Korea Association of International Studies and Professor at Hangung University of Foreign Studies. Please welcome. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good evening in Mexico. Uh, Vice Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Yi Ho, Distinguished speakers, panelists, and guests from the five countries of Australia, Indonesia, Korea, Mexico, and Turkey. I'm more than pleased to welcome you to the MICTA Academic Dialogue on the theme of post-COVID-19 global order and MICTA's role as a middle power partnership. I would like to thank the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs for hosting this meaningful event and for giving KAIS this opportunity to share our thoughts on this very timely topic. Today, the COVID-19 pandemic is changing the way of life, both in domestic and international uh, global communities. Post-COVID-19 era is being characterized as deglobalization and digitalization. Deglobalization has originated from the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequent problems, including restriction on travel and transfer of goods. Digitalization continues to accelerate because of the pandemic and the ICT revolution. Furthermore, the COVID-19 recession is a major ongoing global economic crisis. The crisis, the worst global economic situation since the Great Depression in the 1930s began due to the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still in progress as we speak. This recession has been unusually severe and is causing rapid increases in unemployment in many countries. And as COVID-19 continues to spread, some, con some countries, including South Korea, are putting uh, their citizens on various forms of lockdown. In April, the foreign ministers from 
MICTA uh, countries, MICTA member countries, issued a joint statement to call for robust global cooperation in fighting COVID-19. They maintained that MICTA members, together with other G20 countries, should employ or available policy tools to minimize economic and social damage from the pandemic. In addition, the ministers noted that openness, transparency, and democracy are key factors in providing measures to protect people from the pandemic. MICTA aims to support effective global governance despite its diversity in terms of geography, culture, and social economic situation, all member states are in unity to ensure global governance systems are working in order to improve security and economic interests. As a cross-regional partnership, MICTA's middle powers need to play a more profound and effective leading role in the global community in these enduring times. Indeed, the international community high, has high expectations for MICTA. As a, as, as a matter of fact, MICTA member states have been dealing with issues such as UN Security Council reform, peacekeeping, anti-terrorism, refugee problems, development cooperation, climate change, and epidemics. Now we recognize that COVID-19 is a new disease that requires collaborative response, including sharing of information and solutions between nations. We need to share our respective experiences in addressing the pandemic in an open transparent and democratic manner. At a time when great powers are busy at finger pointing, we should enhance our collaboration further to overcome the pandemic. This academic dialogue is designed to discuss a post-COVID-19 global order and MICTA's role as a middle power partnership as the theme for MICTA academic dialogue this year. We have two sessions today. In session one, MICTA experts will discuss the, uh, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the dynamics of national interest and prospects of a post-COVID-19 global order. In session two, MICTA experts will contemplate ways to deepen our collaboration to promote multilateralism and global health security for the enhancement of socioeconomic recovery and global resilience. Distinguished panelists, today's seminar provides an excellent opportunity to discuss the role of MICTA on global issues and build networks to help solve the COVID-19 crisis, I hope. You will have detailed discussions on ways to encourage creative ideas from middle power diplomacy. I look forward to meaningful debate on what kind of strategies MICTA should pursue in solving COVID-19 related problems. I wish you all the best in your intellectual exercise today. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks a lot for your message. As I said, uh, and also Professor Lee reminds, there will be two sessions in today's dialogue. The first session's theme is prospect for post-COVID-19 global orders and MICTA. In this session, MICTA experts will discuss impact of COVID-19 on dynamics of national interest and prospects of post-COVID-19 global orders. In the second session, we will have the theme of COVID-19 and promoting multilateralism and global health security. 
Miktar experts will talk about ways to deepen our collaboration for promoting multilateralism and global health security for socio-economic recovery and global resilience. Now, let us begin the session one of the MICTA Academic Dialogue in 2020. For the most, I would like to welcome all panelists and moderator, Sogo Kim, professor at the University of Seoul. From now on, Professor Kim will lead the session. Please. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, I'm Sogo Kim from University of Seoul. Welcome to the first session. Uh, as we heard from the uh, Vice Minister and the President, we are living in a new world. Wearing masks has become normal, and social distancing becomes a, uh, very popular, both in word and in behavior. And the, uh, the word positive has become the uh, most negative word these days. It's a very irony. And the, uh, the uh, social distancing turns into the national distancing, dramatically reducing exchanges and interactions among the countries. Then we all are struggling to cope with the uh, new crisis, public health and the economic and social crisis. But as the uh, title of this session implies to us, it is the right time for us to prepare for the future, how to promote multilateralism and global governance in international society in a way to promote cooperation among the uh, MICTA member countries as a uh, diplomatic platform and partnership. This session is about that. This session is about the uh, now and the future of MICTA. And I think there will be some positive and negative assessments about the MICTA. And I will expect there are some policy proposals to develop MICTA more in the future. And I heard that the, I read the newspaper this morning that the, uh, our president, the Korean president, Moon Jae-in, will deliver his speech at the high-level UN meeting next week as the uh, chair country representative of MICTA, then I think that there are some of the proposals and the, uh, the ideas and opinions of this session will may be reflected in that speech. In that sense, it's a very important session. Okay, I will invite the, uh, the first presenter from the uh, Australian side, uh, Professor Jeffrey Robertson. He is working at Yonsei University in Korea, but he is representing Australia. You have uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, 15 Wait, minutes you of on, mask freedom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, first, thank you, Professor Kim. And I'd like to thank South Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for hosting this academic dialogue. I think it's really important at this stage to talk about MICTA. Now, at these events, there's kind of a, a common occurrence which occurs when academics get around a circle and they heap praise upon the subject. Academics are talking about their favorite things and all of a sudden, MICTA becomes perfect. All of a sudden, MICTA can save the world. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I'm not just a balding, grumpy pessimist. All of my criticism is actually going to be constructive criticism. So, my short discussion piece covers two things. One, it looks at the impact of COVID-19 on diplomatic practice and global governance. Two, from this, it discerns the potential impact on MICTA. So regardless of whether recovery from COVID-19 occurs over a short period or a medium-term period, it's becoming clear that it's going to have a lasting impact on diplomacy and global governance. And this is because COVID-19 has actually sped up long-term trends in multilateral governance administration, foreign policy management, and digital technology usage. So how has it done this? Well, COVID-19 has furthered the long-term trend of increasing executive influence over foreign policy decision-making and administration. This long-term trend could have been seen across many countries. 
Uh, you can see it, and it's evidenced by the balance between political appointees and courier diplomats in ambassadorial appointments. It's evidenced by the size of departmental budgets. It's evidenced by the politicization of foreign policy. COVID-19 is a crisis, and we naturally accept greater, a greater executive role during a crisis. But like other crises, a lot of those powers which are passed to the executive in foreign policy administration are not going to return to the foreign ministry. COVID-19 has also brought out growing dissatisfaction with multilateral governance. There's, there's long been a recognition that uh, global governance, uh, the current system of global governance, needs reform. It doesn't fully reflect strategic realities. It's increasingly unable to achieve its aims. It's becoming much more political than practical. And it's even become bloated, inefficient, and corrupt. The classic example of this is the actions and reactions to the performance of the World Health Organization in the midst of a global pandemic. Now, COVID-19 has also forced innovation-resistant, very conservative foreign ministries to adapt to digital technologies. To begin with, the implementation of digital practices, video conferencing, proved difficult and frustrating for many foreign ministries and for individual diplomats. There's no nonverbal signals, no body language to aid communication. There's less opportunities for networking. There's no coffee conversations to float ideas off the record. But over time, digital diplomacy practices are becoming routine. Best practice and preferred techniques are being shared and improved. New skill sets are being developed and personnel training strategies are being implemented. New job roles and new specializations are being created. These changes are actually being highlighted right now. Just the other day, on the 15th of September, the 75th United Nations General Assembly session began. It's the first ever virtual General Assembly. There's going to be no crowded airports. There's no endless presidential motorcades careening down First Avenue. There's no standing room only moments in the General Assembly Hall. And there's no packed media events on the sidelines. Meetings are going virtual. But according to the UN website, the wheels of global diplomacy and sustainable development are still turning at the usual speed. After this event, the biggest question which will be asked is, why haven't we been doing this for the last 20 years? Think of the environmental impact alone. The days of diplomatic travel hotels and restaurants to attend what many publics see as pointless political talk fests may be ending. It's only 75 years ago that diplomacy evolved with the technology of air travel and fly-in, fly-out missions became the norm. Today, diplomacy is evolving again with digital technology and a reduction in fly-in, fly-out missions may be the result. But perhaps most important, the use of digital technologies are becoming viewed as contributing to personal well-being, they're viewed as time-saving, and they're being viewed as cost-efficient. Wholesale adaptation to an online environment presents cost savings that would be impossible in an all-in-person environment. The more time spent in the digital diplomacy environment, the less likely foreign ministries will actually be able to return to the previous uh, circumstances. As has been noted by commentators in education, business, retail, and of course academia, the changes precipitated by COVID-19 are likely here to stay, at least some of them. And this has already been evidenced. Um, foreign ministries are starting to adapt. Just here in South Korea a few days ago, the foreign ministry announced that it's going to seek an additional $5 million for its budget 
in order to build a video conference platform, a secure video conference platform, so that it can continue video conferencing as these meetings spread across the globe. Because of COVID-19, adaptation to digital diplomacy will occur, savings will be made, and these savings will become the norm. It will be very hard to give them up. And at the same time, foreign ministries will face budget pressures over the next five years. With much of their work hidden and being difficult to assign to performance indicators, foreign ministries are always a target of budget cutbacks. With less travel and less nationals overseas, they've got an even <coughs> less supportive constituency than previously. Add this, increased executive power, growing dissatisfaction with multilateral governance, potential cost savings and continued use of digital technology practices. And the calls for budget savings to foreign ministries is only going to increase. So where does this leave MICTA? Is MICTA so indispensable that it will avoid budget cuts? There are widely divergent views on MICTA. At best, MICTA is a platform to build relationships with non-traditional partners and to work ever more closely with traditional partners. So such platforms are essential for diplomats. In the diplomatic kit, they enable a diplomat to build networks, establish reputation, build trust. They strengthen links that will pay off at later dates. They're a valuable public diplomacy platform to promote national interests and strengthen bilateral ties between partners. For Australia, MICTA has served as exactly this. It's enabled Australia to build ever closer ties with Turkey, Mexico and South Korea, and it's given another platform for Australia to continue building its most important relationship with Indonesia. But outside of being an ideal diplomatic platform for relationship building, there's somewhat of a degree of confusion about what MICTA actually really does and what it actually really achieves. In terms of volume, it's probably achieved as much as any other informal grouping. It's put out 26 joint statements, 11 joint communiques, 9 press releases, 17 other statements and summary memoranda, yada, yada, yada. It's run programs bringing together senior officials, parliamentary speakers, journalists, students and, of course, academics. It maintains a website with adequate information and regular updates. But there's a degree of confusion because, it's la because of its lack of subject specificity. Its output covers a wide array of topics, from sustainable development to terrorism, from North Korea to civil emergencies, from migration to the creative economy. The spread of subjects means that it's difficult to define MICTA's purpose. And in public administration terms, and in public finance terms, this means it's also difficult to defend. MICTA credits only three mentions in the Australian Government Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's annual uh, reports. Three mentions in the last three years. Two of those mentions were in the glossaries. At worst, MICTA is a waste of time. It may have made sense seven years ago, but the international environment has moved on. When it was established in 2013, the G20 was still viewed as the preferred body to address the global issues emerging from the 2008 global financial crisis. Support for the G20 has declined as it expanded its mandate to address additional and more complex issues such as uh, the environment, migration, development. Uh, support has decreased to a degree. Both Australia and South Korea are today looking to join an expanded G7, G8. With direct participation in expanded G7, G8, their support and interest in building a coalition within the G20 could conceivably decline. Another supposed purpose of MICTA was to lend middle power support to the strengthening of global governance and multilateralism. And MICTA certainly attracted a lot of middle power supporters. MICTA's early promotion as a middle power initiative drew immediate comparisons to APEC and the Cairns Group. But it was a somewhat different. So new forms of middle powerism were thought about. 
MICTA was considered to be a new form of middle power activism. It was minilateralism, or slender diplomacy, marked by informal and highly flexible coalition building within small networked forums. But with time, hopes for a middle power revival have faded. Individual MICTA members have demonstrated varying degrees of support for the current systems of global governance, rule of law, and international norms. They take widely different stances on hegemonic power, balance, and support. Contrary to initial hopes, diversity is not strength in global governance. Arguably, hopes for a middle power revival have largely dissipated. Our understanding of middle powers in global governance and their role as mediators, facilitators and innovators in global governance derives from another era, and that era is now well past. During periods of perceived decreased security risk, such as at the end of the Second World War or at the end of the Cold War, middle powers were able to balance major powers. During these periods, they did act as mediators, facilitators and innovators in global governance. During pe periods of perceived increased security risk, such as during the Second World War or at the height of the Cold War, they bandwagoned with major powers. During these periods, they cannot act as mediators, facilitators and innovators in global governance. In the current strategic environment, middle powers are arguably no longer in a position to be able to mediate, facilitate, or innovate in global governance. The middle power moment is over. Even with a rapid return to normality, these trends and these changes already brought out will have an ongoing impact. Post-pandemic planning for foreign ministries has a potential to bring transformational change to diplomacy and global governance. So, COVID-19 has a potential to directly impact MICTA. The increased executive role in foreign policy could reduce support for medium-term relationship building platforms such as MICTA. Popular dissatisfaction with global governance could mean less support for less clearly accountable platforms such as MICTA. The environmental, financial and personal cost of summitry and its effective replacement with digital technology, again, could reduce support for MICTA tighter foreign ministry budgets could place added pressure on less accountable platforms such as MICTA. And the decreasing capacity and willingness of middle powers to act could make MICTA seem less relevant. But it's important to note, middle power initiatives rarely disappear suddenly. Rather, they slowly, slowly wither away wither away in neglect. In the wake of COVID-19, rather than being overly optimistic and discussing how MICTA will solve the problems of the pandemic and global governance, it may be time to think about how it will actually survive. It may be time to think about MICTA, how MICTA can evolve to adapt in a new environment before it starts to wither away. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Robertson. Uh, actually, he explained that the um, COVID-19 has uh, changed diplomacy, global governance, and MICTA in many aspects. And in the field, academic field of international relations, there is a, uh, the competition between realism and idealism. But I think that the uh, Professor Robertson provides us a uh, kind of a realistic and little bit pessimistic assessment on the uh, history and the current situation of MICTA. But at the end of the year, uh, his conclusion, uh, the, uh, he provided how we can develop MICTA in a more constructive way to survive in global governance. Okay, there will be some discussions and questions about that in the uh, later session. And I will invite the uh, second speaker from the uh, Mexico, Professor, Jorge Schiavon from SIDE. Are you with us? Yes. Okay. 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 You have uh, 15 minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. I sincerely want to thank the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this MICTA academic dialogue. And I would also like to thank Dr. Kim for his kind presentation. Finally, I would like to thank the trust uh, given to me by the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the last seven years of having designated me the MICTA professor in Mexico. And more particularly, I would like to thank my co-author of the paper that I'm presenting today, Diego Dominguez, who is the director for MICTA within the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So what I would like to do is to argue in a bit more optimistic way than Professor Robertson yeah. that uh, MICTA in 2020 can be a mechanism of political dialogue and coordination between middle, regional, and constructive powers that together can make a difference in terms of providing much needed global governance in a time of crisis, especially with coronavirus and uh, the economic crisis that would most definitely come as an effect of the pandemic. I would argue that the current international system has three huge challenges. On one hand, uh, the decline of the United States as the sole hegemonic power in the world since the end of the, uh, of the Cold War has created a scenario in which uncertainty prevails and competition among states uh, to become the new hegemon is on the rise. And the empowerment of China as the new economic and political superpower and the possibility of a reorientation of the world to the Pacific have been pointed out by many scholars. On, on the other hand, second, Multilateral institutions, as well said by Professor Robertson, are facing enormous limitations to effectively address the most critical situations facing the international scenario. And third, and most important, I think today, uh, the COVID pandemic and the global efforts to respond to it have been both in the health uh, arena and the economic crisis, to say the least, uh, very timid and very small in terms of its effects and impacts. Therefore, the lack of an hegemonic power that imposes order stability in the world and the enormous challenges faced by international institutions to cope with critical situations like COVID-19 and its economic effects have created a growing need for innovative alternatives that can provide public goods in the international level, such as global governance. We argue that middle and constructive powers like MICTA countries can and must play a leading role, not only in filling this capacity vacuum, but also in building and strengthening global governance. Countries uh, to be considered uh, middle powers and constructive powers uh, first have to have the sufficiently important uh, capacities in terms of territory, population, resources, and a significant influence in the international system. But at the same time, they have to be not so big as to be conceived as a threat by other countries. And second, constructive and middle powers must serve as, bridge, as bridges in multiple policy areas, especially between developed and developing countries. In other words, uh, MICTA countries must be relevant in world affairs without being a threat and at the same time serve as representatives of, of the regions or cohorts of similar countries in various realms in order to serve as providers and generators of global governance in the very complicated situation that we're living today due to the coronavirus crisis and its economic effects in terms of generating a, a global economic crisis. So MICTA countries are middle, regional, and constructive powers because they can exert influence in the international arena, especially by building coalitions, by fostering multilateral institutions, and, and serving as bridges between groups of countries and regions. Uh, and they also articulate such influence, uh, preferring diplomacy over coercive or military means. Persuasion, mediation, and the development of norms are some of the ways in which MICTA countries have acquired a leading role and gained legitimacy from other state actors. And second, uh, MICTA countries firmly believe in institutional frameworks to solve disputes and reach consensus 
on the different areas in the international arena, exactly generating global governance in these very, very complicated times. Uh, and as we all know, global governance is this multi-level collection of governance-related activities, rules, and mechanisms, both formal and informal, public and private, that exist in the world today. And global governance, as everyone knows, is better achieved within an effective institutional uh, framework, just as MICTA has created in the course of the last seven years. Global governance is advanced when like-minded countries strengthen international institutions that mitigate conflict, promote cooperation, and bring about better outco outcomes for all parties. And as trustworthy countries, MICTA countries have the necessary le legitimacy to push for peaceful actions to solve the problems that we are facing today in terms of the health crisis and the economic crisis that co will come afterwards. In some MICTA countries, regional, constructive, and middle powers. Furthermore, they have the characteristics in common to make possible for them to share ideas, policies, and goals. And uh, they can serve as providers of global governance in the respective regions and together in the global community as a whole. So why is MICTA important and relevant in the current uh, situation in 2020? Because MICTA differs from other informal groups of countries, like for example, BRICS, the N11, MINTS, EGOS, and CARLS, because they were not created by others, but rather decided themselves to join as, a, as an informal mechanism to cooperate among themselves to promote this global governance. MICTA, as everyone knows, was created seven years ago, and uh, all MICTA countries are members of the G20. So far, MICTA, as already said, has witnessed 17 meetings of foreign ministers and has had the first ever virtual meeting uh, just uh, two months ago to address the COVID-19 and its effects on multilateralism and collective action. It has produced tens of joint agreements on issues like sanitary outbreaks, including one on COVID-19, and many, many other important issues. But what's most important is that they share this vision, and in their vision statement, it says, is that all MICTA countries have both the will and capacity to contribute to protecting global goods and providing global goods and strengthening global governance. Therefore, MICTA seeks to serve as a cross-regional consultative platform to find opportunities for cooperation among its members. The grouping seeks to play a bridging role between developed and developing countries to promote global governance and complement the efforts on regionalism. And finally, MICTA countries see themselves as facilitators in launching new initiatives and implementing global governance reform. And this is exactly what we need today in this very complicated times of coronavirus and economic crisis. For this reason, to face COVID-19, MICTA countries can actively promote the creation of global mechanisms to accelerate the development and universal, and universal access to a vaccine, and also to consider such a vaccine and treatments as global public goods and set pathways to collectively address its interwine intermediate, immediate, and longer-term consequences on global and national economies and society. MICTA countries are members not only of the G20, but of the most important international organizations like the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, and OECD, with the exception of Indonesia, who will soon become a member. Therefore, MICTA has found the spaces of cooperation, not only within these mechanisms, but also by building this mechanism to provide global governance through MICTA as an association. Now, how can they do this in a very effective and efficient way. Well, first, they have to invest in strengthening their, their bilateral ties. And here I will become a little bit more pessimistic as Professor Robertson in the sense that I believe that today the level of communication between them needs to increase and also uh, the, 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 the amount of resources and personnel in their embassies and consulates in the other MICTA countries. Then, through extensive consultation, potential issues of shared interest 
have started to arise, like economic and trade cooperation, promoting open and global economies, upholding and contributing to strengthening rule-based multilateral trading system and the WTO reform, and most important, working together in terms of uh, attending the COVID and the economic crisis that will come afterward. Therefore, 2020 is the right moment for them to serve as constructive middle powers and consensus builders in terms of the international sanitary and medical cooperation to solve the COVID crisis and later to promote the creation and implementation of collective actions to produce and distribute the COVID vaccine and attend the economic effects of the disruption of the financial and trade systems due to the sanitary crisis. As firm promoters of multilateralism and multilateralism, they have the necessary credibility, capacity to support uh, and coordinate efforts to address this very urgent need of international cooperation today. I would like to finish with some policy recommendations to increase the capacity of influence of MICTA countries around the world. First, it is necessary to strengthen the capacities of the ministers of foreign affairs of each of the, MICTA, of the MICTA countries so they can conduct effective public diplomacy individually and as a group. Also, the countries have to invest in increasing human, financial, and material resources at their embassies and consulates of other MICTA countries, but also within their permanent representations in international organizations like the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the World Health Organization, the WTO, and the OECD, among others. Second, MICTA societies need to know and understand each other better. It is true that the number of non-state actors such as business people, civil society, scholars, and students lack the necessary knowledge and information to fully engage in joint projects with their MICTA counterparts. Therefore, if MICTA aims to become a broad network that involves more than public officials and diplomats, some steps need to be taken to bring together all these other relevant social actors. MICTA needs to consolidate also its academic exchange network for graduate and postgraduate students by offering scholarships, promoting academic programs in key fields, and creating opportunities for joint research projects and language training among the five members. Also, trade and investment is an area where MICTA countries can devote resources to achieve their goals. Entrepreneurs and investments from this, and investors from, the, from these five countries need to explore the MICTA markets more deeply and search for business opportunities and joint projects that will bring about economic and social benefits for everyone, especially with the economic crisis that will come after COVID-19. This has already started with a round table discussion, MICTA doing business, trade and investment opportunities, which was just held six months ago in Mexico. And another group that needs to participate more actively in MICTA is civil society. All five countries have vibrant civil society organizations and NGOs that, lead, that deal with current pressing issues of domestic and international agendas, among them COVID and economic. Therefore, they should work together and meet in forums like the Civil uh, 20 within G20, but as MICTA members to understand each other, uh, each other better. And finally, the current COVID-19 crisis must serve as a catalyst for all five MICTA members to present a joint position as constructive powers to facilitate global governance and cooperation during the sanitary crisis, the development and distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and its acknowledgement as a global public good, and finally, updating the financial and trade international systems to provide coordinated solutions of the economic effects of the pandemic to build uh, back the international uh, financial and trade systems. In sum, MICTA countries are and can serve as middle, regional, and constructive powers. If they join their efforts to consolidate and support uh, all relevant state and non-state actors in their countries, the mechanism will gradually consolidate itself domestically and internationally, allowing MICTA to become an even more relevant actor to promote and generate public goods in the international system, especially global governance in a time of sanitary and economic crisis, the one that we are living today in 2020. 
MICTA is the political dialogue and cooperation mechanism which is ripe to serve its, its function as facilitator and provider of global governance in this very complex sanitary and economic crisis times that we are living today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Jorge. Uh, he provides us a uh, more idealistic and more positive assessment on MICTA. So far, we heard the uh, two presentations and the uh, two contrasting views on MICTA. Then I think that the, uh, the very important question is that is it really meaningful to pursue more cooperation among the MICTA countries in the future? In what ways, under what conditions? Or otherwise we can focus on more the great power policies and diplomacies in the middle of the uh, competition between the United States and China. Which way to go, which way to adopt from the, uh, each country's uh, the viewpoint or collectively as a MICTA, as a uh, informal diplomatic the, uh, institution. Then I think that the, uh, the, I expect a very interesting uh, discussions and the uh, uh, discussions and the uh, questions from our three panelists. I will invite if the, uh, the first panelist the, from the uh, representing the Korean side, uh, Professor Kang Sun Ju from the, uh, the Institute of Foreign Affairs and the uh, National Security. You have uh, 10 minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. She's with me, actually, <laughs> here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Uh, it is my pleasure to participate in MICTA Academic Dialogue. Uh, MICTA is a dear subject to, for me because I've been involved with uh, MICTA from its inception. Uh, MICTA is now seven years old and has entered its uh, second phase of operation where the five member states rotate to lead the group for a second time. Um, I couldn't agree with all of you more than um, more, today is an opportune time to review and think critically about MICTA. Um, in this session, uh, I think we hear the word in a positive, negative, pessimist, optimist, you know, mm -hmm. or, already enough. But um, uh, in this session, we are given two assessments of MICTA, which are in a stark contrast. Professor Skiavon um, presents the potential of MICTA on a positive note. On the other hand, the, uh, Professor Robertson next to me is, is rather pessimistic about MICTA and warns us about, about what lies ahead of MICTA. In my opinion, both assessments are correct. MICTA has both potentials, positive and negative. In other words, MICTA is at a crossroad to be or not to be. I, I sound like you know, Hamlet, don't I? Okay. <laughs> Uh, MICTA was born, uh, MICTA was uh, formed in 2013 as a G20 offshoot. Uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia agreed to take their medium-sized resources and direct them toward the ambitious goals, uh, such as uh, strengthening multilateralism, uh, supporting global efforts for stability and prosperity, and facilitating pragmatic and creative solutions to global challenges. When the five countries decide to come together under the rubric of MICTA with a common goal, they could do so because the global environment opened the space for them to shape international relations to a certain degree. At the time, national power was diffusing from west to east and from north to south and negotiation, cooperation, still remain the default option for addressing global issues. Thus, certain expectations were extended on to MICTA's potential contribution to the maintenance and expansion of the international order. However, it didn't take long before such expectations were proven to be over-optimistic. From 2017, MICTA's attention and the activism shifted inward and impactless. There was a couple of factors uh, for this downturn. First, 
Structurally, the global order became less hospitable to influencing from the middle due to great power competition between the United States and China. Neither great power was benign to encourage and accept middle power's entrepreneurial in experts. Unlike in the past, the United States started to see international relations in strict zero-sum terms. The other great power, China, was also proven uninterested in working with middle power countries. This practically shut down windows for middle power activism and discouraged MICTA from initiating and forging cooperation for global issues. And on the part of MICTA, there was a shortage of ideation and resource commitment. Without clear and compelling ideas and resources, it was hard for MICTA to make breakthroughs in inter global issues and play a, a role in bridging, uh, bringing major stakeholders together. Now, all of a sudden, the COVID-19 pandemic descended upon us. The coronavirus pandemic will be recorded as one of the biggest, most consequential events of our time in terms of lives lost and hardships ensued. And in its wake, international relations will look different. Among other things, the coronavirus pandemic has increased uncertainty about leadership. The pandemic has inflicted damage on the leadership of the United States and that of China too. China's trustworthiness is in doubt. And on the other hand, the United States' willingness to lead the world is in question. While it remains to be seen how the United States and China will restore their respective leadership, the post-COVID-19 world likely lower structural barriers and open space for MICTA to exercise middle power entrepreneurship. Especially if the United States and China choose to mix cooperation and competition in their future relations, which is in their interest, MICTA will be able to play a bridging role in global issues. The coronavirus pandemic is both a curse and a blessing for the world. It is a curse in that it has inflicted tremendous pain on humanity. But it is a blessing in that it loosens the grip of great powers on international relations somewhat, somewhat. Uh, we will be able to see if this opportunity comes or not when the United States hold the presidential election in coming November. The result of the United States presidential election might delegitimize some of the zero-sum thinking that proliferated during Trump's time in office and reset the system of international relations. If the United States and China ever need to reach out to MICTA for partnership in the post-COVID-19 era, it is more likely to be the United States that come uh, do so first uh, than China, because the United States has a vested interest in preserving the e existing international order. United States m might be interested in mending the existing international order a little bit, but in a it is you know, good for, uh, generally good for the you know, uh, entire world, I guess. Having said that, um, I have to confess that my assessment has one caveat, though. While an opportunity for MICTA, uh, opportunity for MICTA looms on the horizon in the post-COVID-19 era, it will depend on MICTA's own readiness to utilize such, a, such an opportunity. An array of prep, uh, preparations should be executed on the part of MICTA to harness the opportunities engendered by the coronavirus pandemic. MICTA's prep, uh, preparations for the COVID-19, post-COVID-19 international relations involve three things. First, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia need to renew their commitment to MICTA as a group. The five countries then need to invest resources in establishing an organizational platform for their actions. 
This may mean to select one or two multilateral institutions and anchor MICTA active actions there. Lastly, MICTA needs to set a strategy for international socialization for a sustained period of time, which targets the rhetoric and resources that have convert key actors and spread new constructive ideas and solutions to global issues. If, if the MICTA countries are not willing to go through this exercise sooner than later, the future of MICTA is likely to be less hopeful and dissipating. Uh, dissipating. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Kang. Uh, actually, she provided us the, uh, some limitations pros prospects of uh, MICTA. And the, uh, at the end of his, uh, her presentation, uh, she talked about uh, the future of MICTA depending on the uh, opportunities which can be attained by the MICTA countries in the middle of the uh, superpower competition between the United States and the uh, uh, China and, on in, and also in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Okay, I will invite the uh, second the, uh, panelist from uh, Indonesia, Professor Philip Vormont from the uh, CSIS in Indonesia representing Indonesia. Are you with us? Yes. Okay, you, you have 10 minutes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this event and uh, for inviting me to share some views. Uh, my, my, my responsibility is to respond to the two presentations provided by Professor Robertson and Professor Shiapon earlier. Now, uh, as the Chair uh, rightly mentioned that the two provide kind of a very interesting opposing uh, point of view about MICTA, but uh, uh, let me uh, respond to, to, to the two presentations. Uh, I used to have a pessimistic views as well on MICTA for one particular reason, uh, that we are so geographically dispersed. And uh, uh, at that time, it was uh, hard to imagine uh, how we can move forward and then uh, cooperate uh, in a, a meaningful way. But uh, somehow, somewhat the COVID-19 pandemic altered my view <clears throat> because uh, I think all of us, uh, all countries uh, need to exhaust uh, all mechanism possible to help us tackle this enormous challenge uh, uh, the pandemic put on us on various areas. And uh, I, I enjoyed the presentation uh, by Professor Robertson and uh, Shia Hons, uh, but uh, let me take two uh, keywords uh, from their presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Robertson mentioned that the, the role of the middle power in particular now, I think, uh, uh, as an innovator, uh, middle power right now uh, cannot, I think, balance the, the, the major power, the two superpowers. But uh, innovators, I think, is the key word. Uh, we should find ways to, to uh, innovating the ways in which we do diplomacy, uh, we construct multilateralism, and so on and so forth. And Australia actually gave that example in the 80s. You know, as an aspiring middle power at the time, Australia came up with this idea of human security, uh, that uh, kind of a soft security approach that uh, not meant to uh, balance the superpowers, but provide an alternative view of security at that time. So since then on, we, we were very familiar with the, the term of human security, how we tackle, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, various uh, cross-border security issues and so on. And Australia, uh, in this way, uh, I think could be seen as an innovator, uh, as a middle power uh, player at the time, together with Canada and Japan. Now, why should not we, you know, once again, uh, play that role as an innovator of this uh, uh, pandemic situation? And uh, Professor Shiafon, uh, the keyword that I like is the middle power is a constructive power. And, uh, uh, but he warned us that unless we identify our common concern and our common interest and strategy, then we will not be able uh, to play the constructive middle power role. And uh, I think this pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, exactly provide that opportunity for us uh, for these uh, few reasons that I would uh, explain. Number one, pandemic is the global problems that requires a global resolution. Our work today uh, in dealing with the pandemic should not be defined by the rivalry between the US and China because uh, we cannot afford that. We need to find ways to cooperate instead of uh, 
or competing uh, with each other. And especially, we should not be defined by the competition with the, with the superpower. Number two, public health. International public health is now the national security and international security matter. So this is a global problem that requires a leadership uh, that I think now should come from multilateral cooperation. Because as uh, Professor Robertson and, and Professor Shiafan mentioned, before the pandemic, uh, the two superpowers kind of withdrawing from their international role and uh, to provide uh, international public goods. The US and China, for example, I think they undermine various multilateral institutions. They have this uh, <clears throat> trade competition and they ignore WTO, you know, uh, that's why uh, it's, it's clearly undermining the, the multilateral institution that the international community has been trying to build in the past few decades. And also the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and the, from various UN agencies and so on and so forth. So the US essentially is withdrawing from its traditional role as the provider of the international public goods. While China at the same time has a long way to go to prove herself as a, 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 a possible uh, provider of international public goods. And, you know, there are trust problems and so on and so forth with China. So where should the leadership come from? Uh, the only alternative, I think, is the multilateral platform. And there are actually various multilateral mechanisms that are still working. Uh, we should not be too pessimistic. And then the G20 has, that has been mentioned by, uh, by various earlier speakers uh, is one example. And, uh, you know, it provides example as well that uh, we middle power and uh, major power can still cooperate. G20 can play a very important role in the post COVID-19 situation, especially in the reviving the economy, uh, you know, given their economic size. So uh, the, the role of the G20 cannot be set aside in this, in this regard. And some middle powers actually are in the G20. And then uh, that's why I think that middle powers now need to defend, politically defend multilateralism. And we need to ensure uh, that we have uh, sufficient funding for this multilateral, various multilateral institution. And especially uh, when it comes to COVID-19, of course, it's WTO that we need to defend. Uh, so we have to ensure the commitment to multilateral institution as a dispute settlement mechanism in the future. Uh, WTO, for example, we need to revive WTO. Uh, reform is necessary, but we, we cannot afford to undermine our multilateral institution. And uh, what are the challenges then for MIPTA? Uh, I agree there are so many challenges and there are so many uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, number one, uh, MIPTA members, most of the MIPTA members, all of the MIPTA members actually are regional player, regional Im important players. And uh, in this regard, uh, MIPTA I think can collaborate with regional organizations because uh, you know, Global institution might be too big and too large and too complex. And regional organization, I think, uh, relative to global organization, uh, regional organization is in a better position to understand the context of the national situations of its member. So the smaller it is, the better it will be, you know, in essence, uh, in the future. And for that, uh, uh, in that context, uh, minilateral can also be important. And, and MIGTA is a, such a minilateral organization uh, that can be a good venue for uh, supporting uh, areas of cooperation. And uh, I think uh, one uh, concrete proposal that uh, I can put forward here is that uh, given the fact that now uh, uh, COVID-19 is not only the, uh, they call it, uh, it's not only the, the black swan, it's actually the big elephant in the room. So we should, you know, spend our energy, our investment in, in dealing with the COVID-19 together uh, uh, as, uh, as a MIGTA. As MIGTA, and there are various uh, areas, I think, uh, that can be possible for, for MIGTA members. Uh, WHO uh, and international health regulations identify eight core uh, areas of cooperation or areas of uh, 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 responsibilities for each member countries of WHO. And these eight areas can actually be the focus of cooperation among MIGTA members. And we can help you know, each other in, in, in dealing the, uh, the requirement by the WHO and the international health regulation to meet these eight core areas, namely the uh, preparedness, uh, risk communications, human resources, and uh, labs and uh, science cooperations and so on. And uh, you know, these five countries, I think are in, uh, in a good position to cooperate in this uh, limited 
but very, very important areas, I think, for some years to come. And secondly, I think uh, this is, uh, I would all, say, I hope I'm wrong. One minute, one but, minute, uh, please. One minute, yeah. Uh, this, this is not going to be our last pandemic. <laughs> there will be future pandemics, so we have to better prepare now. And also, uh, another global uh, issues that can be dealt with by minilateralism is an environment and disasters. And all these Milna member countries are actually prone to disasters, environmental disasters. Australia had a bushfire last year. Indonesia suffered from various disasters uh, from year to year. Turkey suffered from earthquake, Mexico as well. So these areas that somehow are reminiscent of the human security approach that Australia put forward in the 80s now can be replicated and we can be innovative and uh, constructive uh, in a way for the future. Thank you. I should stop there. Okay, thank you, Professor Robont. I think that the two important messages from the uh, Professor Beaumont is that the, um, we need to pursue multilateralism through multilateralism. And there are many areas where we can cooperate each other within the framework of MICTA. That is one message. Second message is that the, uh, the human secret concept is really interesting. It was done by the Australia in 1980s. Then we can do that, exactly the same thing in after the uh, COVID-19 crisis, collectively as the uh, MICTA member countries. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And the, uh, I will invite the uh, third panelist from the uh, Turkey, the Professor the, uh, Karadiniz. Is it correct? Okay. Yes. Karadiniz yes. Yes. Yeah, correct. from the uh, uh, Gaziantep University representing Turkey. Okay, you have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for uh, Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Korean Association of International Studies for the organization of the MICTA Academic Dialogue. And I'm glad to be a part of this uh, panel. Uh, I want to make an argument and also by making an assessment of the discussions uh, that have been pointed out throughout this panel. Uh, just uh, as we all said, the COVID uh, pandemic present both challenges and threats and risks for MICTA and also opportunities uh, for strengthening its presence in global governance and restore uh, its, its legitimacy, both in the eyes of its members and in the international community. And I am on the side of the ones who think that uh, this um, pandemic presents more uh, opportunities, opportunities more than risks for MICTA's uh, presence. Uh, first of all, rather than uh, losing its relevance for changing in international environment, I think uh, NICTA, with the advantage of its flexibility as an informal institution, has the potential uh, to become an example of middle power diplomacy in the post-COVID area. Uh, why I think is that uh, there are some opportunities, as I said, both from the systemic level and from MICTA uh, level. Firstly, systemic developments, as we all said, the rise of the middle power moment in uh, global governance opens a window of opportunity for MICTA. As we all said, the uncertainty and anxiety in the current order has been accelerated by the emergence of the pandemic and the response of the superpowers like China and US have disappointed the international community. Therefore, this makes multilateralism became in a risk of, uh, you know, just not providing public good for the community. Therefore, this opens a new, another new chapter for middle power moment seen in the beginning of 2010s, uh, just in the establishing of uh, emergence of NICTA. And in the prevailing uh, uncertainty, informal institutions uh, are providing necessary tools for states to cope with the challenges in a more flexible way. And I think this opens a space for MICTA to act. As we all said, I mean, the previous panelist has also pointed that the health governance may be uh, the area, the niche area, which MICTA can push its energy more into uh, making its presence. As uh, Robertson uh, says, uh, uh, Mr. Robertson said in the beginning, its lack of, uh, its lack of specificity in the uh, MICTA as an organization, maybe health governance will become an important 
uh, niche area for NICTA to be much more present. And secondly, as we all witnessed throughout the pandemic uh, management, South Korea and Australia was successful uh, in middle powers in their performances. And uh, this it may increase their efforts, may increase the energy within NICTA members. And uh, in the, this makes uh, take NICTA effective roles in humanitarian response vaccine development and acting, uh, acting as a bridge uh, between co in, in coordinating vaccine uh, between developed and developing uh, world. And uh, related to this, I think um, uh, the last, uh, I mean, in the, as a result of June elections of uh, United Nations, uh, we have seen Mexico, Turkey and Indonesia have taken very important roles in the United Nations. And for instance, Turkey's uh, candidate became the uh, presidency of the General Assembly. Mexico was chosen as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Indonesia and Mexico were both uh, chosen as the member of Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. And uh, these roles increased individual capacities and as well as strengthening their collective effort in empowering NICTA's presence in their common niche areas. And also we uh, see the willingness on the part of NICTA members during the pandemic that they wanted to survive a NICTA, to uh, make NICTA push uh, ahead. Uh, because we see that uh, without US and China binary, I mean, without analyzing from this perspective, they coordinated their eight uh, program. As we will see maybe in the second panel, the discussions, uh, just they have made eight coordination and uh, they have aid cooperation in uh, terms of uh, humanitarian assistance and uh, because this is why this is important because both are uh, close uh, allies of United States and but in terms of trade they depends on China that's why uh, without their uh, leading they try to coordinate their efforts. Uh, therefore, this is an important opportunity uh, for us to think that NICTA will have a future. However, as uh, all said, there is risks uh, in the uh, waiting for NICTA. Uh, the biggest risk, risk is uh, deteriorating economic situations in member countries, low growth rates and high unemployment, and uh, as we all uh, know that in informal institutions, sustainability depends on the commitment and interest of its participating governments. Uh, the governments uh, should commit themselves, themselves to its uh, endurance. And uh, to conclude, uh, as, I, as Richard Fold underlines that, the most important question for the future of global governance is that how the feeling that we are all in this together feeling during the pandemic will be kept in other global issues. And uh, multilateralism is the best option to build, uh, rebuild stronger world. And this opens middle powers new space in the uh, aftermath of the uh, 2008 crisis. And the uh, last point I wanted to say that performance is the path for legitimacy. And now I think it is time for MICTA to seize the moment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much from the uh, Turkey. Uh, four ambassadors and the uh, vice uh, deputy uh, ambassadors are waiting for us to deliver their own remarks. Uh, please turn on your video, the ambassadors and the uh, deputy ambassadors. Ambassador Hardy. Umar Hadi, Ambassador, Indonesian Ambassador Umar Hadi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, why don't you turn on your video? I think uh, the host uh, should allow us to do that first. Please, uh, please turn on the video, Mr. Prophet, the uh, Ambassador Hardy. Ah, okay. Thank you, Professor Kim. 
Okay, and okay. Uh, you, yeah, you, you have your yeah, five minutes. Short message, please. Okay, welcome. <laughs> no, it's uh, very short. Just to thank you and to congratulate the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs for this initiative. I think it's a very good idea to reflect on the future of, of MICTA. But to me, uh, what is important is, you know, we, we need first to work uh, for survival. We need to survive. Second, we need to recover. But then also we need to have a propulsion. We need to uh, make efforts uh, that, so that the, the post-pandemic world, uh, global governance especially, uh, will be better. Uh, so we don't want to simply survive and recover to the old system or old situation, but we want to have a better uh, uh, global system uh, of governance. Now, what and how MICTA or uh, countries, uh, the so-called middle powers, can contribute to that, I think it's all about um, uh, keep on uh, charging with ideas, opinions, uh, uh, and uh, it, it will take a lot of uh, diploma diplomatic work and it should start now. Uh, uh, therefore, I think it is very important uh, that we keep this kind of conversation alive. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, and thank you very much to all uh, the academics uh, taking uh, part in this dialogue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, next time I will invite the, uh, the, the Deputy Chief of Mission from the uh, Australian Embassy in Korea, Mr. Ian McCoville. Hello. Hey. Ian McCoy. Right. Yes, uh, I'm, I've, we're just trying to get on our video at the moment. Um, here we go. There we go. Thanks. Okay, who is Ian McCoville? Okay. Thank you. We got you. Yeah, you so have good. five minutes. Yeah. Excellent. Firstly, let me thank uh, Second Vice Minister Lee Tae Ho. Uh, for your introductory remarks. And Australia, of course, commands the Republic of Korea's leadership uh, of MICTA this year in the face of uh, a very challenging international um, uh, geostrategic uh, environment, but particularly uh, impacted by COVID-19. And I think this is a very uh, important uh, and innovative um, initiative that you have taken and I think it also picks up on a remark made by Professor Geoffrey Robinson, um, my fellow Australian, and very good to see you again, uh, Geoffrey, uh, about the importance of us being able to uh, utilise digital diplomacy uh, much more effectively than we have in the past. Uh, we can certainly do it better, and uh, uh, clearly we agree with you there, uh, Geoffrey, but I think it is indeed uh, within our ca capacity and capability uh, to marshal um, the digital diplomacy era. I also just want to um, uh, pick up uh, a remark uh, made from the other presenter, Jorge Chiavon, uh, uh, in relation to middle power diplomacy. And I think if there is one message uh, that the Australian government um, would like to underline and very consistent with our foreign policy white paper, uh, it is that we do indeed see uh, a large role for middle power diplomacy. In fact, we see it as absolutely uh, essential as we navigate uh, through what is increasingly becoming um, uh, the uh, major power rivalry uh, playing out uh, geostrategically between the US and China. So let me just uh, make a few more general remarks uh, about how Australia views and values MICTA. Clearly, it's a flexible cross-regional grouping, um, a very close 
um, like-minded uh, countries on a number of issues, but not all issues. And I think in many ways that is its strength um, as a, a way where on those issues we can agree on, uh, we can move forward and harness um, our um, uh, collective energy to advance um, particular agendas. Uh, also, I think MICTA has clearly a important role in responding to the complex global challenge of COVID-19. Uh, and it is, of course, early days for MICTA in grappling with this, but I think this is an important uh, kickstart, if you like, to um, identifying areas that we can move forward. In the future, MICTA uh, will certainly be an important voice in support of an open international system based on universal values and transparency. And Australia very much looks forward to taking on the MICTA chair uh, in 2021 um, from our good friends, uh, the Republic of Korea. And it'll be uh, picking up and, and running, if you like, with that same agenda um, where we advocate for rules that protect sovereignty, preserve peace, but can curb excessive use of power and enable international trade and investment. And I think we've already had um, some remarks made about challenges to uh, the global rules-based order. Um, and I think there have been um, uh, some, some very good points. I think Philip's um, uh, uh, colleague from Indonesia has underlined that. And I think this is a role that I think MICTA needs to um, start leading on uh, and ensuring that uh, those countries who are not necessarily uh, the largest and the biggest uh, and with the loudest voice can work collectively uh, to push forward um, with, uh, if you like, advancing the common global good. So they are uh, just a few remarks from us. Once again, um, I would like to thank very much uh, our Korean colleagues for uh, uh, initiating uh, this uh, very important and useful dialogue and uh, also our appreciation for all the presenters. Uh, and I do wish you all the best uh, for a very productive day of discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, next, I will invite the uh, Wemir Kelly Cole, the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Embassy of the uh, Republic of Turkey in Korea. Are you with us? Uh, yes, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, you have a, uh, a okay. few minutes to well, deliver thank, your remarks. Thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this very uh, valuable um, online event. Uh, really appreciate all the uh, input here. And uh, allow me to make a few short uh, comments, remarks about uh, Turkey's position on uh, MICTA. Um, uh, we believe that MICTA serves as a successful uh, cooperation and coordination platform among our countries. Its flexibility underpins its effective and practical uh, cooperation modalities. And we as MICTA countries are influential regional players and work to assume a pivotal and constructive role in our respective regions as well as international organizations. We account for a combined population of over 540 million people, a gross domestic product of almost 6 trillion US dollars, and more than a 1.5 trillion dollars share of the global trade. Our foreign ministries and diplomatic missions are in active collaboration in organizing many different events and activities aimed at increasing MICTA's visibility in a different uh, in different countries and international platforms. MICTA cooperation on sustainable development is progressing well. We should also focus on our uh, cooperation on innovation and digital transformation. We support a rules-based, free, open, transparent, and inclusive multilateral trading system, which is crucial for global growth and our economies. The World Trade Organization's important role in protecting free and fair trade must be strengthened. We also support uh, Korean uh, chairmanship's priorities, and they are also important to us. Uh, 
first of all, multilateralism, uh, multilateralism constitutes the basis of the international institutions, which we rely upon to facilitate the cooperation opportunities and dealing with the risks and challenges on a regional and global scale. Sustainable development and SDGs are a national priority for Turkey too. Peace and security are also at the heart of our solidarity in MICTA, as well as being a matter of national importance to Turkey. In addition to these, MICTA can also be a platform where we can endorse each other's candidacies at international institutions and demonstrate this support through joint statements. This uh, would strengthen our solidarity and contribute to the visibility of MICTA. We can also initiate joint projects and events on issues of mutual concern, such as natural, natural disaster management and migration in collaboration with relevant international organizations. Furthermore, MICTA policy planning consultations, as well as meetings of the heads of development agencies should continue online uh, during the pandemic restrictions. Um, it is also crucial to develop new ways of working to cope with the challenges posed by the pandemic. The uninterrupted flow of international trade as well as logistics and transportation should continue to be one of our top priorities. The ongoing pandemic has clearly demonstrated that global health crises should uh, they require common solutions. This is why we intend to work more closely with MICTA countries in, health, in the health sector from biotechnology to immunology to uh, vaccine production, uh, which would also require the involvement maybe of our universities as well as uh, our science and tech institutes. Uh, to uh, conclude, uh, we are uh, uh, also committed to expanding our cooperation through MICTA in economic, political and social cultural domains. Turkey supports the idea of taking MICTA to the leaders level and uh, the MICTA 2.0 initiative, which uh, these, uh, as these will increase MICTA's international visibility and influence. We can also work on uh, organizing online summit that would discuss issues related to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Emir. Uh, finally, I want to invite the, uh, Mr. Raul Mendoza Gallo from the uh, Embassy of Mexico. Thank you very much for waiting for a long time. Okay. Go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Professor Kim Seul. Um, my name is Vladimir Vasquez, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Mexican Embassy. Uh, on behalf of Ambassador Bruno Figueroa of Mexico, I would like to express my appreciation for MOFA uh, for hosting this academic dialogue a truly trademark of the mechanism where scholars share fresh visions and ideas emerge about where to go from the standing point. Um, the world was different in February 2020 when in Mexico City, the MICTA condemnation was handed over to Vice Minister Itejo. Ever since uh, a global pandemic hit MICTA countries badly, but Korea reacted quickly and started sharing experience tackling COVID. The way Korea does is regarded as exemplary and its cooperation is very welcomed. Other countries, including Mexico, are still learning and watching Korea's steps carefully. A new world order is emerging in the post-COVID-19 era, not following a world war, a class or civilization or climate change hitting our planet beyond control. It is a complex virus, a nanometric combination of genetic material that is proving hard to defeat. Amid challenging circumstances, uh, make the countries continues to be responsible. Global actors convinced of the irreplaceable value of diplomacy and have a long standing multilateral tradition. Proof of that is that it is worth recalling that in Mexico in April, uh, Mexico introduced in the United Nations a resolution entitled International Cooperation to Ensure Global Access to Medicines, Vaccines and Medical Equipment to Face COVID-19, which was adopted smoothly. The time has come for dialogue to contribute to the consensus building process necessary to address the most pressing and current challenges. Also, 
The time has come for middle powers to highlight significant presence in the international scenario and to identify innovative strategies to face global challenges. In December uh, 2019, during a MIGTA closing activity in Seoul, Ambassador Bruno Figueroa noted that the world faced at that time a complex international scenario in which balances are shifting Challenges are diversifying and opportunities are emerging. Its comments turned prophetic. Everything continues to be true, but a scale, sadly scale as coronavirus showed difficult to handle. To navigate these uh, troubled waters, we are committed to make the process. We are enthusiastic of the process of the dialogue and we look forward to strengthening our role as MIGTA middle powers. We definitely conclude that by cooperation, by sharing our experience, and by having a dialogue, substantive dialogue, these challenges will be beyond us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Raul. Uh, Thank you all the uh, ambassadors and deputy ambassadors from four countries uh, for your time and the uh, remarks. And please turn off your uh, video and audio from now on. And we will go to the, uh, the discussion session. And Professor Kim, do you want to say something? Okay. All right. Um, so far, we discuss the, uh, the limitations and prospects of MIGTA, and we heard the uh, positive and the negative aspects of MIGTA. And we all know that the uh, reality is different from the desirability, right? And uh, even though there are some policy suggestions to develop MIGTA in the future, but we all of us know that yeah, there are limitations. And the, uh, we need to think about the, the, the important factors affecting the future of MIGTA. For example, we can think about the uh, systemic factor, as you mentioned, the uh, competition between the United States and China, and the, uh, the role of the MIGTA in the, in the middle of the competition. Or the, there can be some domestic factors of uh, each country, from Australian side, from Indonesian side, from Turkey side, from Mexican side, from Korean side. And also, we discussed the, uh, the COVID-19 related the, uh, economic and social crisis and the impacts of the, uh, this crisis on the future of the MIGTA. And I think uh, we can consider the leadership factor, the leadership of, uh, of the, the member countries and their commitment, their interest in pursuing MIGTA's development in the future. Then there are lots of factors connected to each other to affect the uh, future of MIGTA, then we can discuss those kind of uh, factors. And I think that the, uh, because the, uh, the pro Professor Robertson provided us a, a little bit negative aspect assessment of the MIGTA, I think that the, uh, you have a lot of things to say to us after hearing the, uh, the discussions. Okay? Okay, I will give you some time. Wow, I didn't think I was negative at all. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, my presentation uh, pointed out some of the challenges which MICTA is going to face. Mm. But I, I don't think we can actually ignore these challenges. You know, every foreign ministry of MICTA member countries is going to face challenges over the next five years. They're going to face budget cuts. And it doesn't matter how many foreign policy feel-good words you use, you know, consensus building, mechanism building, cooperation, global goods, it doesn't matter. That team down at the Ministry of Finance is going to be looking over every initiative which is underway and they're going to be scratching out the ones which they think they can make enough savings from. And so MICTA is going to have to transform, it's going to have to evolve. If it decides to evolve using um, perhaps a much greater focus on uh, video conferencing technology or perhaps move to a 1.5 track with a, a more narrow frame, 
then it may actually continue and you know, um, it may actually, by spending some time in the wilderness, it may actually be able to strengthen itself and return at a later date when those budget finances are returning and it may be much more powerful, may be much stronger and much more useful. But at the moment, it's going to face some severe challenges and I don't think there's any way to avoid this. Any, any comment on the, uh, Professor Robertson's the, uh, the remarks? Anyone from the uh, panelists? Presenters? Yeah, just briefly. Okay, go I ahead. Uh, I remember from my Asian politics course many, many years ago that in Japan, the word kiki means at the same time crisis and opportunity. I think that in this moment, we are exactly within MICTA in a kiki moment in which there is a huge crisis in terms of the uh, health situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis that will come afterwards. But at the same time, there is a great opportunity for many lateral mechanisms like MICTA to work through multilateral organizations to actually make a difference. Constructive powers need to fill in the void, the gap, which is being left by a receding U.S. and a not yet ready China to take care of managing world affairs. Therefore, it is the moment for constructive middle powers to provide that governance. Therefore, Kiki, crisis means opportunity. Okay, good point. Another Point? Yes, if I may. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, crisis and opportunity. I, I like that as well. <laughs> um, but I think MICTA is in a position where we can't just use all these catchphrases and we can't just use all these feel good ideas. It's going to face some real challenges over the next five years because it basically hasn't achieved enough. And all middle power initiatives need to actually achieve something to be sustained. Um, you know, they need to actually um, build up their momentum over a period of time so that they can be sustained and they can catch that funding which is available. Um, and I don't think this period of time when we're in is actually able to, um, yeah, there's no space for middle powers to act um, as we imagine them to act. Um, things such as human security was brought up. Human security, incredibly important, and middle powers were very, very active on it during the 1990s. But the 1990s is a million miles away from today. The 1990s was a period when there was one major power, and that major power was willing to engage with the globe and willing to allow middle powers to have their space to uh, play more active roles. I can't imagine seeing middle powers being able to do anything like that today. The middle power moment has changed. Middle powers are going to have to transform in the way they behave. They're, they're going to find it more difficult to pursue active diplomacy. They're going to find it much more difficult to pursue everything we accept as normal middle power behavior because that idea is set upon a totally different era. Okay, um, but I think that the, uh, when you compare the 1990s and 2020, in the uh, 1990s there was one single superpower, mm -hmm. then everything was the, uh, done by one single superpower in reality. Mm -hmm. But you are arguing that the, at the time, during that period, the role of the middle powers was more important. But think about the uh, current situation. There are two superpowers competing with each other. Mm -hmm. Then I think that, they are, in a sense, there are more rooms for middle mm -hmm. powers to act more positively. You don't think so? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I think in a situation where you have two major powers competing against each other, middle powers ultimately will have to decide upon which side they want to follow. A middle power which rests in between the two major powers only ends up being split between the two. 
it ends up with internal divisions. Middle powers will ultimately have to choose which side they want to follow, and they will have to actually uh, support what side they believe has the best interests of global governance at hand. And um, that's the only way that middle powers can actually secure a much greater say in global affairs is through multilateralism, but they have to decide which form of multilateralism they believe is going to be in their interests. They can't waver between the two. Okay, I will give a chance to you. And I, uh, uh, Professor Kim mentioned that, um, uh, the presence of uh, two great powers uh, uh, that you know uh, negatively affect middle power diplomacy, but you know, in 2020, but it is not the first time that there were two superpowers uh, you know hindering the middle power diplomacy. Well, uh, there were in you know, the United States and Soviet Union in 1970s and 80s, mm -hmm. but you know, actually there was a, uh, another time or another example that you know, middle power diplomacy was very successful. Okay, so. Um, the presence of two great powers does not mean that, you know, um, does not necessarily mean that it uh, hinders you know, middle power diplomacy. But it does not necessarily mean that, you know, the middle powers can grab opportunity, diplomatic opportunity to uh, push some, you know, the positive and constructive ideas between the two great powers. So there is, you know, the, um, both the risk and opportunities for middle power diplomacy in the 2020, especially after the, you know, the corona, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the international relations become more fluid and more uncertainty and both the great powers uh, uh, seize both the, uh, the weaknesses and strengths in their you know, the capabilities in, lead, uh, in leading international relations. So the United States and China, um, they may, ha may have you know, very shrewd calculation about the international relations after the, the, all the dust of you know, uh, corona, uh, coronavirus pandemic settles down and then you know, they may uh, approach middle powers uh, to increase their opportunity or their, uh, uh, their uh, the leadership in the leading the world, of, uh, world affairs. So, it is not guaranteed, but you know, we don't have to be you know, overly pessimistic or overly optimistic about middle power diplomacy. It is all about the interactions between the uh, great powers and between great powers and middle powers. And then we just uh, a little bit you know, be patient. We need to be a little bit more patient to see what happens after November. Okay, thank you. Okay, Professor Valmont or Karadanis, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, okay, if I may. Yeah. Um, I somewhat uh, disagree with uh, the, the weak suffer what they must perspective put forward somewhat by Professor uh, <clears throat> Robertson. Because there are many cases where lesser power are not choosing the two sides. So I think uh, it's, it, it really depends on the issue. Uh, looking at it from Jakarta, uh, from Indonesia, being a, a non-aligned movement country for so many years, and ASEAN has been in his uh, more than 50 years existence, try to avoid <clears throat> uh, and uh, somewhat successfully uh, to avoid interference from major powers and so on and so forth. So there are actually cases where we should not always be forced to choose between the two sides because, uh, of course, uh, there are so many other variables that we need to look at. Uh, as far as the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic is concerned, you know, we are not uh, fond of what the U.S. has been doing in, in, uh, in, in tackling the, the COVID-19 problem for example, uh, that the U.S. undermines the WHO and so on and so forth. And uh, at the same time, uh, we are probably not uh, really fond of uh, what uh, China has been doing as well in, in tackling the problem of COVID-19. And so there are, I think, more nuances right now. I agree. Uh, it, it's totally different from 1990s. But uh, at the same time, there are nuances and uh, these lesser power are catching up in terms of the economy and so on and so forth. So uh, the... Uh, I don't think uh, you know we should uh, 
think about that these countries will eventually need to choose between the two sides because uh, history told us that that is not the case. Uh, since the US uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, there are countries that can play independent roles and so on and so forth. Okay, Professor, hold on. Tara Denise, do you want to say something before yeah, we uh, give a chance to the Robinson? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also agree with uh, the other panelists that we should wait for some time to see whether multilateralism will uh, be pushed by the middle power diplomacy again, especially in terms of U.S. withdrawal from World Health Organization. Uh, the political vacuum left after the U.S. Have, will be um, filled by the middle powers. And uh, we will see that, uh, for example, in the aid coordination uh, in, the, in the Pacific region, or we see in terms of Turkey, uh, coordination of aid in Middle East and Europe. Europe, Europe in uh, region. Therefore, uh, there is some room, and especially we will see that in the uh, Alliance for Multilateralism, for instance, initiated by uh, Germany and France, and middle powers are increasing their voices, and uh, not to be uh, sketched between uh, the US and China um, geopolitical uh, competition or just uh, the political competition. Therefore, we should. Uh, we, we, we should um, uh, be more optimistic, I think, uh, in waiting for the time to come to the middle power diplomacy again in global governance. Thank you. Okay, I think that the, um, we have an experience of uh, living in a bipolar world, as uh, Professor Kang told us. But I think we need to think about whether this crisis public health and economic, political, strategic, social crisis is a kind of a, a perfect storm which will fundamentally transform the uh, international society in the future. If that is the case, I think that the, uh, we cannot compare the past and the future. Maybe. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, just, just on my mind, the, the, the mention of the non-aligned movement, uh, I think that's a good example. But you have to remember that the non-aligned movement were not predominantly middle powers in the classic sense. They didn't actually seek to punch above their weight, they didn't seek to use active diplomacy, and they didn't use any of the characteristics of what we normally consider as middle powers, the Australia, Canada, Netherlands, yada, yada, yada. Um, they certainly were able to avoid being overly influenced by the major powers, and they did that through you know, um, thinking about and by adhering to their non-aligned movement policies and ideas, but middle powers are not in a position to do that. If a middle power wants to punch above its weight and influence global governance, if it wants to innovate, to facilitate, Ultimately, sooner or later, it needs the support of a major power. So if you think of APEC, or if you think of the Cairns Group, or if you think of human security, any major middle power initiative, sooner or later, had to at least get some degree of support from a major power. Quite often, the major powers were very opposed at the beginning, but sooner or later, they had to get some degree of support, or at least acquiescence from a major power. And, um, well, that's going to be much more difficult nowadays. Uh, I mean, we've got one, you know, I mean, we're talking about we've got two major powers now, but really we don't. We have two powers that are disinterested in multilateralism. We have two powers that are fundamentally um, outside of traditions that we are used to. So, yeah, maybe come November it will be everything <laughs> different. We don't know. But what can we do as a middle power, individually and collectively, in the competition between the uh, two superpowers? Well, that's it. Taking I... size, only taking size, making friends, making allies, making enemies. Is that all? I don't think so. No. There well, must be room yeah. for us to do. Right. Well, that's it. I think the middle power moment is over. I think middle powers are going to be playing a much lower profile role as we go into the next uh, period of this strategic environment. 
middle powers have had their time, they've had their moments, but middle powers are, whether they like it or not, going to be playing a less significant role. And I think we've already seen parts of this. Um, we've seen a lot of middle power initiatives come to nothing over the last 10 years. We've seen some really good ideas. Um, so back in 2007, uh, Australia's Prime Minister Kevin Rudd had the idea of an Asia-Pacific community. The idea of bringing together all the countries from the Asia-Pacific and having a security community where they could discuss the problems that are, are passing right now. I mean, what a force, you know, what foresight, what a great idea. But it came to nothing. It came to nothing because the ability of middle powers to push their initiatives nowadays have decreased. Their capacity to act as innovators, facilitators, and mediators has decreased. Okay. Uh, I think yeah, that's enough for us to <laughs> discuss that, that, that question. I collected the question from the uh, online participants uh, beforehand, and uh, most of the uh, questions are related to the uh, COVID-19 crisis and the uh, superpower competition between the United States and China. But there was one interesting question from one the uh, online participant. That is about the difference of the roles of the uh, middle powers between MiGTA countries and other middle power countries. What specific role can be played by MiGTA countries compared to the other middle powers? There can be other middle powers in the world, right? Then what kind of a uh, specific role can be played by MiGTA? Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I've already built myself up as um, somewhat of the opposition <laughs> today. <laughs> so I think it's probably better letting Jorge uh, <laughs> answer that one. I personally don't think yes, that um, MiGTA is able to do anything different from other middle powers, uh, I'm afraid. Jorge? I would like to second that question. Yes, what we see today is, for example, within uh, G20, we have the G7, which are the industrialized, powerful countries. Uh, we have BRICS, which uh, has one superpower, China, but has four other middle powers, and you have MiGTA. Uh, and there's a huge difference between BRICS and MiGTA. And for me, BRICS is uh, it's a group of countries which are against the status quo and want to change it in their own benefit. And on the other side, MiGTA countries are more status quo uh, countries which want to generate governance for a better uh, and more effective management of the international system. Uh, let me just say one word in terms of my agreement and disagreement with Professor Robertson. I agree with him that there is very, very little space in terms of middle power uh, diplomacy in one area, which is security. However, I completely disagree with him in the sense that there is no space in other areas, especially in the low politics areas, for middle power uh, diplomacy, specifically in terms of reconstructing the trade and investment systems after the COVID crisis, and more specifically in health issues. Health issues are not that important for superpowers. So middle powers don't have to choose. They actually can serve as agents of governance generation, specifically in the case of COVID. And the best example for this is the vaccine. If MiGTA countries or other middle powers or other constructive powers actually work together to make sure that the vaccine is a public good, which is readily available at a good price for everyone who needs it, that's something which is needed for the whole world because uh, COVID, uh, you get it whether you are from a rich country, a poor country, a middle power, a great power, a non-power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, there is a space in the low politic issues for great uh, diplomacy from middle powers. I agree with him. In security issues, it's more difficult, but not in practically every other issue. Okay, thank you very much. I will give one minute to Professor Kang. Yeah. Okay. Um, the I'm not criticizing Professor Skiavon, but I don't think BRICS is a middle power. 
I mean, but I agree with him on that, you know, BRICS is a you know, revisionist power. But I disagree with him on that, you know, MICTA is a you know, status quo power either. So MICTA is kind of in the improving power because uh, the MICTA, all the five countries got benefited from the, uh, the current uh, liberal international order, but it, it, uh, uh, the, the liberal international order, you know, led by the United States, it, it's not perfect. It had many good things, but it was not perfect. And, it's, and the, as time changes, it needs certainly the improvement or reform. So the MICTA is not revisionist power, neither you know, uh, that was a status quo power. MICTA is a kind of in the improving power and the make the, in the international, the liberal international order works for many more countries in the world. So I think MICTA as a I mean, middle power is in a differentiated from other middle powers in that sense. Thank you. Okay, uh, as is always the case in other conferences and seminars, we have limited time. Then I think we have to stop yeah. here. Uh, even though there are some realistic and pessimistic views on the MICTA, I hope 2.0 initiative, 3.0 initiative continues in the future. Thank you very much for participation, all the panelists and the uh, online participants. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all participants in the first session. It was really excellent presentation and discussion, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I also appreciate all the audience watching this webinar. Next, we'll continue with our next section in an hour from 1 p.m. Please stay tuned.
Now, let us begin the second session of the Midterm Academic Dialogue in 2020. I would like to welcome all participants and audiences. This session will be led by Ajin Choi, professor at Yonsei University. From now on, I will hand over microphone to Professor Choi. Okay, thank you for your introduction. I am Ajin Choi, professor at Yonsei University, Seoul. And I will serve as a moderator for the second session, COVID-19 and promoting multilateralism and global health security. Before actually this session starts, I would like to thank the KAIS president, Professor Yi sang Hwan, and conference organizers for inviting me to this timely and important meeting. As you know, the first, the first session discussed the macro level change and uh, prospects of the post-COVID global order. But this second session will more focus on the practical practical and more concrete issues by looking at the role of the MICTA in promoting multilateral health governance and cooperation. I hope this panel can provide and exchange important ideas and eventually produce the constructive policy alternatives. This, this session, we have two presenters and three discussants. So I'm happy to introduce all the panelists. And then first, panelist is the Professor Ibi Fitriani from Indonesia University. And the second presenter is the Professor Emel Parar and Mamar Dal University in Turkey. And the first the discussant is Hyunjin Choi, Gyeonggi University, Korea. And the second discussant is the Caitlin Byrne, from Griffiths University from Australia. And then last discussant is the Professor Erika Sandoval at SEED in Mexico. You know, I'm very happy to see all of you here. And then our, so therefore, I, I would like to ask the, our first presenters to speak. And, and then the title of her presentation is MICTA Spons uh, Multilateral Cooperation in the Pandemic Era. Professor Abby Fitrani, could you start, please? Thank you, Professor Choi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the conference organizer who already invited me for this important uh, webinar. I'm pleased from Jakarta. I would like to send a very warm uh, greetings to all of you. My presentation is about uh, this, uh, actually I put question mark at the end of my question uh, title. So it's I'm kind of asking uh, can can Mika uh, form a multilateral cooperation multilateral cooperation uh, to to tackle uh, uh, challenges uh, resulted from this uh, pandemic, but uh, to explain my uh, thoughts uh, better, I would like to use uh, the slide. Uh, so I will share with you my slides. Can you see uh, the slides? Yes, okay. Uh, so I put a uh, question mark at the end, but let me explain, yeah. I will go through very sh quickly. Uh, five uh, should be five uh, steps uh, just would like to see before i'm looking at mika uh, i would like to see the it, uh, the, the, the world in this uh, pandemic era which is very special time in our history uh, and uh, whether i would like thankful or not we are now in the this kind of circumstances and from previous session this morning uh, they have been uh, a discussion, if I cannot see it's a, it's a debate about whether MICTA uh, still have time to materialize or to be a middle power. But I'm kind of agree with those who think that there is always possibility. Uh, big, powers con uh, big powers competition is not the whole world. Uh, there is still room for MICTA for middle power uh, to uh, maneuver and to find a way 
And this is what I understand, my understanding of uh, international relation in pandemic era. We uh, suddenly in a crisis of global healthcare system, not only in one or two countries, but across the country, not only in a underdeveloped countries, but even in the most advanced country experience that. So this is the first. And the second, we found that state very much in what looking now, even the countries that used to be form a coalition or even in a regional institutions, you can see uh, people, uh, countries now try to pro pro prioritize their own uh, needs and national interests. And uh, 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 vaccine nationalism is one of the example of that. And of course, we then, because of this problem, we are following, uh, we are watching now and experiencing now global economic crisis. And on the top of all those uh, very uh, difficult circumstances, we can still see the continuing strategic competition between major powers. It is not only in the a, in a, in problem of the competing on the vaccine and uh, and blaming where the virus come from but also uh, but also on the area that should not be discussed or not be not become the problem in this time like uh, things in uh, south china sea so this is a very very difficult circumstances and we experience the because our session will tackle on this uh, pandemic era i would like to the problem of our global health system uh, for sure, we have uh, capitalization of health services and medical equipments. And it's very much uh, remarkable because our world also have a majority of the world is poor and do not have access, enough access, a good access to the health service and medical equipments. And we have seen that not only in, not only in uh, major countries, but also in small countries. Uh, not sorry, not only in small countries, but also in major countries happen. And uh, we can still see the future is not free from uh, health problems. And some of the epidemiologues already predict that there will be more and some more epidemic in the future. So actually uh, what I think what we need is uh, the need for fair and inclusive global health governance. So our session uh, this time is very, I think indeed uh, very in time. Uh, how about Mikta? Uh, some discussion this morning has uh, so uh, this morning so session already so some debate, but this is my position. Uh, we each of our our countries, Mikta, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia, overwhelmed by our domestic health and economic problems. Not only because it is uh, we are not ready, but also there are so many complications domestically and. Uh, not only pressure from external, but also pressure from internal society, especially in the domestic uh, democratic country. I found it's more democratic country is more difficult, at least for Indonesia, it is much more difficult to handle this issue in a democratic circumstances. If you are in a authoritarian system, maybe it's easy to just impose rules and ban people and lockdown, but not in democratic country, you will get a lot of protests. So this is very challenging. And but uh, in, on the, uh, in this, amidst the circumstances, MICTA countries still struggle for strategic autonomy. And this somehow was related to the debate this morning in the first session about whether MICTA uh, can be uh, autonomy uh, apart from those two major powers. But for my, my position is, yes, uh, somehow we struggle for the strategic autonomy, but some Manage to get it, but some not. Uh, we have to uh, go. I don't think generalization for all middle powers that cannot avoid that uh, bipolar uh, circumstances uh, is the right thing to, to say. But for me, some of the middle powers manage to get it. That's, that's depend on the tradition, philosophy, and history of that country. Some countries do not see the possibility to be more independent because they have never independent since their independent, uh, existence in their country. But some countries manage 
uh, to get uh, experience and uh, to be more uh, uh, strategically autonomy uh, 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 in their history. So this is my, and uh, unfortunately, our MICTA is not a close partnership. It is an uh, association, several, last several years, but it is not yet a close partnership, unless for some cases, and this is more on bilateral base, like Indonesia and Korea is quite close and we have strategic partnership. And during this pandemic, uh, Korea helped Indonesia with some of the medical equipments. Indonesia also have special relation with Australia, uh, we have also a strategic partnership. We just finished uh, uh, SEPA. But apart from that, uh, as a part of MITA, five countries working together, uh, I don't think we have uh, achieved uh, what has been expected before. Uh, so uh, uh, in this kind of circumstances, uh, can we, uh, MITA, uh, promote multilateral cooperation uh, in order to to work especially toward the global, a better global health uh, system. Uh, we, I think we have to see uh, our strength and our strength is the, uh, still relevance as a group of middle power. MIGTA, I think still relevance, uh, apart from the, a lot of pessimism. Uh, yes, I think still relevant because uh, it is the time uh, when the multilateral is needed and who has the potential to do it, middle power. Who else? Uh, small power will be much more difficult. So as a country that have some uh, capability uh, especially, and also leading in their respective region, uh, MICTA is still a relevant uh, a group of middle powers. And the second, the strength of MITA is the power of network. We have a lot of network already, Indonesia with Korea, Indonesia with uh, uh, Australia, Indonesia with uh, Turkey have quite a lot of uh, that maybe with Mexico because of the distance quite far away, not as developed as the relation network relations with Korea and Australia, but I'm sure with more interaction and even discussion like this already put up in some networks. So I think the power of network among MICTA has growing, has been growing. And the, sec the third one, we have a soft image. We are not uh, such a uh, 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 aggressive, uh, in, not in an aggressive mode. We are uh, friendly countries and we would like to cooperate. So this is, I think, important. And uh, countries in MICTA are generally flexible. We have a flexible approach and somehow we have a realistic goals because we understand that we are not big power. So we, 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 we would like to target what we possibly can achieve. Uh, Finally, uh, str the strength of MICTA is some countries, MICTA, if not all, have a, a, some innovation of healthcare and develop medical health industries. I would like to mention Korea and Australia for this uh, aspect uh, because uh, countries, uh, those two countries already uh, experience uh, more advanced economy. And so they have more advanced healthcare and uh, medical industries too. But I'm sure uh, the pandemic also pushed countries like Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey to also think um, and invest more on their healthcare system. So we can expect a better response to this uh, health system. So, but we have also a lot of challenges, even though I'm not a uh, 100% pessimist, I can still uh, see some problems in Amikta's uh, co collaboration to provide or to build a fair and inclusive global health system. First is uh, some of us, not all, have a close link or even dependent on major powers. Uh, it is unavoidable in this current of circumstances, but uh, the, the closeness with the major power somehow uh, challenge the uh, uh, strategic autonomy of MICTA countries. And the second is lack of pooling resources. We, uh, apart from uh, intellectual discussion or uh, almost there is no uh, pooling resources among MICTA countries. So this is so loose. So, so loose and maybe because of that, maybe it is not time yet. It is only several years uh, this association will, uh, 
uh, only se- several years. So maybe we still need time to develop this kind of association. And because maybe we are in different area, there is still thin common interest. There's country like Indonesia, Korea, and Australia that have more interaction in ASEAN plus plus uh, is in East Asia Summit, but uh, and even in ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus one. But apart from that, especially with Mexico and, and Turkey, uh, the the interest is still very very thin. Uh, there is maybe because each of us are very uh, uh, engage in our respective area. And the fourth is uh, there are also other mechanisms, uh, regional associations. So MICTA is not the, the I have to say, uh, MICTA is not the first priority for Indonesia, for example. ASEAN is the first, pri- first priority for collaboration. And ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus one is another mechanism that we still think as a priority. MICTA may come uh, after that. So it is not uh, the, 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 the association that uh, become uh, the first priority if it comes to our foreign policy. So there, and uh, don't forget, there's also still bilateral mechanism and other multilateral forum. So uh, the existence of MICTA in a country like Indonesia is still being questioned. Uh, because of that, uh, MICTA have a weak coalition. So co- cooperation like us, like this, what we are doing now among the schools is, I think, uh, one of the good steps to, to to, to enhance uh, make the existence uh, to face these challenges. So I would like to conclude my presentation uh, with uh, two, th- two things. One is that COVID-19 pandemic has created multifaceted global crisis that uh, threaten not only future survival of the state, but also uh, the human being, ourselves. And under these circumstances, um, uh, it is, uh, to compete for their interest in the remain and create magnitude challenge. And this is consensus create magnitude challenge to multilateralism. But nevertheless, it is a general knowledge that if we would like to survive, we have to collaborate. So, and multilateral cooperation is the best way to do it. And MICTA has frequently overlooked, uh, uh, I'm sorry, MICTA has frequent, uh, frequently overlooked potential. We have a lot of potential, but often, frequently overlooked. So it is uh, maybe this time is a good time. Now crisis usually pulls uh, and drive a lot of opportunity. So it is time for MICTA to realize its potential and to promote, especially to promote multilateral co- cooperation. Uh, however, MICTA have individual problems and collective weaknesses to material is promised. So it's kind of challenge and but also opportunity. And I think two things is in the front of MICTA that if possible, we should collaborate. One is about the, to create fair and inclusive global governance. And the second is how to tackle this financial crisis. With this, I would like to stop. And thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you. I will now... Uh, send the uh, back to professor Choi. thank you okay okay thank you for your presentation and professor petriani shows that in the face of the pandemic crisis the world is becoming more polarized and less developed countries has no enough capabilities or resources while the great powers is more focused on the domestic agendas and also you know focus on the competition with each other increasing protectionism and national sentiment she also points out that under this circumstance the middle powers has strengths but at the same time, weakness in overcoming this, you know, pandemic crisis. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Our next presenter is the Professor Emel Paradar at Marmara, Marmara, University, Marmara University in Turkey. Okay, it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Korean Minister of Foreign Affairs and Korean Association of International Studies uh, for having organized uh, such a great uh, academic event on MICTA and its future. And also, I would like to thank you for having invited me to this event. Uh, as the title of my, I don't know if the technical staff will share my, because they told me yesterday that they'll share my PowerPoint uh, presentation, but anyway, I'll share it myself. Is it okay now? Okay, just yes. yes. Uh, could you see it? Yes. Huh, okay. Um, 
But I have to, f sorry, I think there is a problem here. Huh. Okay. Uh, as the title of my presentation suggests, I'll talk uh, about middle powers and their uh, role and their potentialities and limitations in uh, global health governance more specifically. And of course, uh, as, uh, as we will focus on MICTA, I will focus on MICTA as our case study. Um, Let's look at the outline of my presentation. First of all, I will uh, talk about Edelbeet, of course, uh, uh, and uh, about uh, the revival of middle power diplomacy. And I will investigate whether we will be able to um, investigate whether MICTA can contribute to this revival and whether can uh, MICTA uh, increase, uh, whether can MICTA increase its visibility and status in global uh, governance. Uh, in this post-corona era. Then I will try to draw a general picture of uh, MICTAS uh, and MICTA countries' uh, position uh, in global health governance, and I'll provide some inward and outward uh, looking patterns of uh, MICTA and MICTA members' uh, uh, position in global health governance. Then I'll uh, investigate whether uh, global health governance can be a new, dip uh, new dish niche diplomacy area for MICTA. Of course, here I will talk about its potentialities and limitations. And in the last part, I will try to give some recommendations. Um, in this part, uh, I will start by saying that uh, the coronavirus pandemic has made clear that there is room uh, for middle powers uh, to play a greater role in global governance, especially in global health governance. So my departing point is that, and I believe that, and I argue that um, the ongoing strategic unraveling in the international system may allow middle powers to create a, a common ground for both improve, improving political and economic ties among states and enc encouraging trade and investment and combating global problems. So uh, uh, I am on the op optimistic side, and I think that there is still room for middle powers to revive and to come together and to uh, respond together to global challenges like uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, on the other hand, they have, of course, some limitations. Uh, first of all, middle powers will do better if they pool uh, their resources to, uh, to create a multilateral, multilateralist league uh, that will serve as an external block. And uh, as you know, uh, established institutions are too much reliant on US and China. And uh, UN and US and China dispute is widening and structures uh, outside US and China, uh, Chinese participations are becoming uh, even more important for an effective global governance. So for the effectiveness of, for an effective global, for an effective multilateralism, we need other structures, we need other powers who will uh, engage in this um, uh, new multilateral era. So MICTA, I argue that MICTA is one of these platforms as an informal uh, international institution it, it has potential to take concrete steps and, to, uh, and it can reinforce post-COVID alliances and partnerships among emerging and middle powers. As a group being composed of middle powers, of course, we call it we generally in literature, we contextualize uh, MICTA as a middle power, uh, middle power uh, group, in middle power institution. Uh, it can uh, revive uh, middle power activism uh, in two main uh, areas, global, and sustainable development and global health governance. In fact, since 2013, since its foundation, MICTA has failed to create impact both among its members and in other international institutions and platforms. Uh, for instance, a good sign of MICTA's failure in club governance is, uh, is that its members do not still organize side events or mini submits in the G20 annual submits, as did the BRICS countries. In short, MICTA is not sufficiently visible in other uh, formal international institutions like UN. Uh, it's not too visible in UN General Assembly, for example, uh, and in other UN institutions, funds and agencies, and also uh, in, in the G20. However, I, I still believe that there is still room for MICTA to revive and to play distinct roles in the post-COVID era, as did Canada and Australia in the post, uh, in the post to Second World War. Uh, now I will look at uh, the important uh, outward patterns of uh, MICTA's uh, power in global governance, because in this session you will uh, mainly focus on global governance, a uh, global health governance. Uh, here, uh, I'm using a table 
and I'm, I try to compare uh, MICTAS members um, in what patterns. So, so I look, I put their total deaths, current assessment of SDG3, SDG trend uh, position, and also I put uh, their current ex health expansion per capita, and also I look at uh, whether they have universal health coverage uh, or not. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 outbreak has clearly shown the importance of state capacity and resilience of, uh, of national health systems. And domestic health policies of states have determined both how they responded to COVID-19 outbreak and at what degree they have been affected by the virus. So we must first of all look at whether the members uh, succeeded in responding uh, to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So uh, as you see, in the table, Korea and Australia appear as the top two countries among five MICTA countries who have successfully achieved the SDG3 target and efficiently managed the COVID crisis. Among five MICTA countries, these two countries have the lowest mortality rate. On the other hand, Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey stand as MICTA countries who have been respectively the most negatively affected uh, by the COVID-19 in terms of no number of deaths uh, caused by the virus. In terms of their SDG3 performance, these three countries uh, appear to have the lowest performance, I'm talking about Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey, of course, in achieving SDG3, while Korea and Australia um, maintain the highest SDG3 achievement. SDG3 refers to the uh, health sector, of course. Uh, in case MITA members can sign uh, health cooperation agreements among each other and further foster their knowledge and experience sharing in health sector, it's likely that their capacity to take action against the future outbreaks uh, would, be, would considerably improve. So a significant increase in the health capacity of MICTA countries will certainly make the grouping bring the global governance, uh, global health governance to the agenda of, their, of the other international organizations, formal or informal, and push MICTA to launch projects for the third countries willing to improve their domestic health capacity. COVID-19 outbreak has also negatively influenced the implementation of SDG3 um, at, in, at the national level. So uh, countries like uh, MICTA members uh, have a potential uh, to uh, help uh, other uh, the third countries uh, to improve uh, their uh, national capacities and, or, and surveillance capacities. When I look at the universal health coverage uh, of the MICTA members, uh, all the MICTA members uh, have universal health coverage. Uh, among these five uh, MICTA members, Mexico appears the one who achieved universal health coverage uh, the most recently, uh, in 2019, Indonesia, I think, uh, uh, could achieve uh, um, universal health coverage, although it has some uh, finance, uh, finance, financing problems uh, regarding uh, universal health coverage. When I look at the outward-looking uh, patterns of MICTA in global health governance, uh, first of all, I look at MICTA's commitment, MICTA, MICTA's commitment to uh, global health governance, here I look at the uh, MICTA foreign minister's uh, joint statements on COVID-99 and I compare uh, this uh, commitment, this uh, recent commitment with MICTA's uh, commitment on uh, uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014. And in my, in the present, in my paper also, I compare MICTA's uh, commitment to global health governance with the uh, joint statement made by BRICS uh, in June uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, I, when I compare these two uh, statements, MICTA's statement on uh, COVID-19 and BRICS statement on COVID-19, I found out that uh, BRICS statement uh, proposed much more concrete solutions uh, to respond to the crisis uh, in a joint way. Uh, and, um, uh, but in general, their focus is similar. Uh, they, they focus on uh, better trade relations and how to and they uh, to, uh, try to find responses, common responses uh, to uh, cover uh, their trade loss. Uh, and they and different from uh, MICTA statement, uh, BRIC statement uh, suggested uh, to um, on MICTA statement underlined the necessity to. Uh, use uh, the loan, their emergency loan system. And uh, also they pointed out that a new development bank uh, could help uh, BRICS countries affected by the virus, uh, uh, some sort of uh, new uh, funds. 
So these are uh, related with the MIGTAS commitment to uh, global health governance. Uh, and as a second step in this part, I look at MIGTA countries' voluntary contribution to the World Health Organization. In my opinion, and uh, as I, and, and I studied these uh, in my previous um, uh, projects, uh, countries' voluntary contribution to World Health Organization or to global governance is very much is, is very is very much important uh, to understand whether uh, they would like to play greater role in uh, in some issue uh, specific issue areas. So uh, this contribution, this voluntary contribution, is a sign of uh, countries' uh, willingness uh, to play role in this specific uh, issue area. So when I look at uh, this commitment uh, of voluntary, commit voluntary contribution of uh, MICTA countries, I see that South Korea took the first place, then uh, it is followed by Australia, Turkey, Indonesia, and Mexico. And so uh, Mexico appears uh, to be the lowest uh, contributor, a uh, voluntary contributor uh, to the World Health Organization. Uh, here, perhaps I yeah, I have a table, uh, so you can see the numbers. Uh, here, I couldn't find relevant data uh, regarding uh, Mexico's uh, uh, um, voluntary contribution to World Health Organization. Uh, so when you look at the data, you will understand uh, which countries have willingness to play a greater role in World Health Organization. Um, so uh, in this part, uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the potentialities and limitations of MICTA, and I'll investigate whether global health governance can be a new diplomacy, new niche diplomacy area for uh, the grouping. Um, I think uh, we must, first of all, keep in mind that uh, during the pandemic, uh, intergroup relations uh, of MICTA uh, were fostered as a result of increasing exchange of medical supplies and the knowledge sharing among MICTA members, which can be considered a positive result of MICTA's militarism. And I argue that militarism is very, is very important for fostering multilateralism. Informal governance, on the other hand, is very much important for, uh, uh, for an effective multilateralism. So uh, as a scholar, I think that if uh, these uh, multilateral groupings uh, the activities of military groupings uh, develop, uh, we, could, we could have much more efficient multilateral uh, governance. Um, in this regard, if MICTA establishes linkage between its global de development agenda and its global health diplomacy and succeeds succeed in establishing a human security network composed of states and NGOs, it would raise its profile and visibility in global governance. So these are the positive uh, sides of uh, MICTA, MICTA's uh, uh, contribution to, or MICTA's uh, capacities uh, regarding global, uh, in health gov governance. International development, as you know, is one of the priorities of MICTA as a grouping, and uh, Two-thirds of uh, MICTA's uh, declarations, joint statements, are related with international and sustainable, de sustainable development. And if, if MICTA could succeed in establishing a linkage between these two niche areas, uh, uh, global development and uh, global health governance, I think uh, it could find room uh, to uh, move ahead uh, in this new uh, uh, issue area. Uh, another aspect regarding uh, potentiality of MICTA is uh, the fact that international development assistance is needed so that developing countries can make rapid progress in building national surveillance capacities. And I think that MICTA countries with their extensive capabilities and networks in the field of development assistance might help developing countries increase their national capacities to take control and manage outbreaks by increasing health sector allocations in their individual development aid. MICTA countries may also consider including private aid into their broader development assistance. The inclusion of special assistance may be effective in both promoting general health and using human development tools effectively. So I think that MICTA countries have, uh, are important players in the, in, the, uh, in the international development area. And if they could uh, 
collaborate uh, in this uh, specific uh, issue area uh, to give common resp response to the third countries, which have uh, less uh, resources. Uh, I think uh, MICTA can increase its status as a uh, club in global governance. So what is net next for MICTA in the post-pandemic time? Here I will uh, try to give some recommendations for MICTA's adaptation to the new era. Uh, the pandemic has proven right that middle powers have capacity to balance their economic vulnerabilities with resilience, especially in the global health sector. Uh, and uh, the assessment of MICTA's uh, inward and outward looking shows that MICTA has potential to play a larger role uh, in global health governance. If global health governance will be added to MICTA's agenda as the new policy era, area, uh, despite its risks, uh, of course, it can help energize and transform the platform into the post-pandemic era. The pandemic has proven right that middle powers have capacity to balance their economic vulnerabilities with their uh, strong uh, health sector, as I said. Uh, so, uh, MICTA, if MICTA countries and MICTA itself uh, can, uh, can succeed in narrowing the gap between uh, the, its rhetoric and uh, practice, it can assume new responsibilities in global health governance, most, pa most particularly in the field of development assistance for health. And this may take, uh, this, may, this can, can make MICTA more visible and operational uh, in global health governance. I am also suggesting or recommending uh, uh, to MICTA members to, talk, to think about the creation of a fund similar to BRICS emergency assistance loan. Uh, of course, they have all uh, budgetary restrictions, but uh, they can discuss uh, whether it's possible to have such an emergency loan as uh, mixed countries uh, uh, did or found. And this, uh, this kind of loan may also help make the countries comply with their G20 commitments and strengthen global health diplomacy within the G20. MICTA may also prepare a global health working uh, global health work program in order to encourage joint dialogue, dialogue and participation within the G20 by working in coordination with, with key actors such as the World Health Organization and the World Bank who influence the global health agenda. In addition to this, if MICTA members take decisive steps to reinforce cooperation within the grouping in order to reach the targets of uh, Agenda 2030, uh, and actively engage in health financing and development support, support programs. MICTA can update its status as an informal institution aiming to contribute to strengthening of rules-based multilateralism. Um, um, last but not least, global health governance has now become truly multipolar with many players with converging and diverging interests, in what ways informal international institutions can contribute to global health governance still remains uh, as an un uh, underexplored topic. So as scholars, if uh, we can uh, debate and analyze uh, more uh, this kind of uh, topics, I think we can also contribute to uh, the strengthening of uh, MICTA uh, in uh, global governance, and we can also contribute to the increasing uh, of its uh, image and visibility uh, in, um, in the changing uh, global uh, governance. MICTA, in this sense, may be a good research topic for two main reasons. First, it its members have a good record of dealing with the pandemic compared to some higher income countries in the West. Second, MICTA needs a revival so as, to be, so as to be an effective club which can take new initiative, initiatives in specific policy areas, such as sustainable development and global health governance. However, in order to be a legitimate actor in the eyes of international public opinion, MICTA members must also work harder so that their COVID-19 policies will not result in both weakening of democratic norms and practices and the strengthening of authoritarian policy, politics in their own countries and elsewhere. Thank you very much for having uh, listened. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And Professor Paraldar argues that with respect to the global health governance, MICTA countries individually have specific cap capacity to the combat with the combat against the pandemic 
And at the same time, the nature of the middle power diplomacy has merits in promoting multilateral cooperation in global healthcare governance, health governance, sorry. And now we actually move on to the discussion sections. And the first discussion, discussion is the Professor Hyun Jin Choi from Gyeonggi University, Korea. He will give the comment on the first paper, the, the Professor Fitnani's presentation. And could you start, please? Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Hyun Jin Choi from Gyeonggi University. Uh, first of all, it's my uh, great honor to speak uh, on this important topic in this uncertain time of pandemic crisis. So uh, now I'm going to discuss about Professor uh, Fitriani's uh, presentation about multilateral uh, cooperation. So she pointed out some important issues about some challenges for multilateral cooperation, such as inward-looking countries seeking selfish interests and also uh, many countries are uh, seeking strategic competition as well. So these problems pose a lot of challenges for fair and inclusive multilateral cooperation. Uh, so uh, as noted by Professor uh, Vitriani, this pandemic crisis mm -hmm. can be uh, overcome only through multilateral cooperation. And I believe that no one would deny the importance of a fair and inclusive global health governance in this uncertain time. And we, the members of MICTA, must take a progress towards such an ideal, but the reality is much more complicated. So uh, in this discussion, I want to introduce some kind of challenges uh, against this uh, ideal. And today, the biggest challenge for global health government governance could be how to share and distribute coronavirus vaccine, and which might be available by the end of this year or early next year. Some countries, such as US, China, and the United Kingdom, have secured their own supplies through bilateral deals with vaccine developers ahead of anyone else. And for example, the United Kingdom has pre-ordered enough vaccine for about five doses for a person. And, and many newspapers and magazines and call this behavior as vaccine nationalism or vaccine hoarding. And the WHO also gave a warning that the vaccine nationalism will prolong the pandemic rather than shorten this crisis. And also the science magazine said that those vaccines will eventually will, uh, reach most countries in the world, but only after powerful countries have protected their own people. So the question is, can we achieve fair and inclusive allocation of COVID vaccine? And as for now, unfortunately, the answer seems to be negative for the following reasons. And first reason is, the COVID vaccines are private goods. So unlike public goods, those private goods are sold by private companies to earn profit and fulfill the needs of their buyers. And both public goods and private goods are for the benefit of consumers, but while public goods benefit everyone, private goods are only for those who can make a payment. And theories of international relations especially in realism, suggests that achieving multilateral cooperation is much harder when countries are concerned with private goods. And the second problem is domestic politics. Access to coronavirus vaccine has become a priority in domestic politics. In many countries, issues surrounding this COVID crisis has become a domestic political problem. And in the United States, even the issue of where to wear mask or not has become a topic for political debate. And for leaders of high-income countries, especially in democratic countries, securing enough amount of vaccine as a way to recover from uh, economic damage at home is important for their approval ratings and elections. So I think this domestic politics make matters worse. 
And the third issue is the balance of power politics has returned to international relations. The strategic rivalry between U.S., China, and possibly Russia is shaping national response to COVID-19 crisis in a uh, selfish manner. And a recent New York Times article introduced a story about spying activities between the three great powers in the cyberspace targeting vaccine research facilities in the United States. So in this era of new geopolitical rivalry, we may rephrase all the statements of Kenneth Walsh, a, a great a political scientist. So maybe I can say like this, when faced with the possibility of cooperating for COVID vaccine stage, they feel insecure, must ask how the vaccine will be divided. And they ask not, will both of us gain, but who will gain more? So this kind of strategic rivalry and the return of a balance of power politics makes international cooperation for this COVID crisis difficult. And for these reasons, as of now, I think the fair and inclusive distribution of COVID vaccine will be difficult to achieve. But nevertheless, there is some improvement in multilateral cooperation for global health. And I think this is where uh, we, the middle-income countries, can make a meaningful contribution. So let me give you one example. So recently, led by WHO, more than 170 countries around the world have now joined the global vaccine allocation plan called COVAX. Its goal is to help buy and distribute vaccinations fairly around the world, including low-income countries. Unfortunately, the three great powers, US, China, and Russia, and those countries are also the leaders of vaccine development, and they abstained from this initiative. But in the absence of great powers, the MiGTA and major countries, such as Germany, UK, and Japan, also joined this effort. And we pledged money to have access to a broader range of vaccine candidates. So uh, as the middle power countries, and we have an advanced uh, technology and a lot of experience and knowledge of controlling uh, this infectious disease. And also we have advanced manufacturing facilities for vaccine. And therefore, although it is a tough time for international cooperation, but we can make a contribution for the fair and inclusive uh, distribution of vaccine. And also, we need to remember that without global cooperation, the virus will continue spreading. And therefore, this crisis can give us a lot of challenges for multilateral cooperation. But still, there is some opportunity that middle power countries can make a contribution. OK. OK, thank you, yeah. Professor Choi. And then Professor Choi, comments is focus, focuses on the feasibility and the effectiveness of the you know, multilateral cooperation in this, you know, in this topic. And then next discussant is the Professor Byrne at Griffiths University from Australia. Could you start, please, Professor Byrne? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we is that coming through all right? Great, excellent. Um, look, good afternoon all. It's such a pleasure to be joining you and being part of this virtual dialogue. I'm joining you from Brisbane in Australia and I'd like to extend my thanks very much and congratulations to the Korea Foundation for hosting this dialogue in their year as MICTA chair. It's really good to be a part of it. And Professor Choi, thank you for your excellent chairing and to all the panellists, uh, really pleased to be part of this discussion. Given that I am sitting here in Brisbane, Australia, I'd like to begin my intervention with an Australian protocol by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm, from which I'm joining you today. Here in Brisbane, that's the Turrbal and the Jagera peoples. 
and in the spirit of reconciliation, pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that to all First Nations peoples around the globe. Uh, that's something we do in Australia fairly routinely these days, but it's an acknowledgement that I don't make at all lightly. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to do that to really highlight the relevance of traditional knowledge and local wisdom, uh, particularly from our Indigenous communities and the responsibility that we have in Australia, but across MICTA nations, to highlight and integrate that into our contemporary problem-solving frameworks. So I'd like to just say today's discussion has really been excellent and I think it's offered us a valuable opportunity to think about NICTA and what it stands for and what it might achieve in a post-COVID world, but also to think about what it means to be a middle power uh, and how this connection of nations actually makes sense. Maybe I was a little bit like Phillips Vermont. Uh, he mentioned earlier in the day that he was a little bit sceptical about the power of MICTA. And I've probably been uh, a little bit in that same boat. And then I was thinking about my own personal experiences living in Australia, having been posted to Mexico and spending a couple of years there. Today in my current role uh, with the Asia Institute, working very closely with our biggest neighbour, Indonesia, uh, but also working with colleagues in Korea and, and colleagues right across that, the Asia-Pacific region. And I'm also involved in an engagement group with the G20, the W20, which was really put forward into action by Turkey. So it's interesting when you start to think about the connections that exist. In many ways, they are uneven. Uh, those common interests uh, uh, can be difficult to find and perhaps they are, much like Evi Fitriani mentioned earlier, a little bit thin on the ground. But, but nonetheless, they are there and, and evident in different activities uh, that I think each of these nations is engaged in. And I think that's something really positive uh, to work with. And I, and I would note that... Um, Jeffrey Robertson this morning talked in a fairly pessimistic way about the nature of the connections and what Nicta might achieve. But I thought in finishing, he was spot on in saying, if we are to make this work, we have to invest in effort, uh, effort into the kinds of dialogues we're having, at, wh at what level they are happening at. We have to invest effort into the way that we can support each other, including at the moment, um, in a current environment where ministries of foreign affairs are under increasing pressure and costs cost to save money, to produce efficiency dividends uh, without necessarily domestic constituencies to support them. Uh, and additionally, where diplomacy is increasingly undervalued. A diplomacy not just in its traditional sense, but of course across a number of public uh, dimensions as well. And I think Korea is well placed uh, to advance that sense of value in diplomacy. So I think we are in a really difficult uh, situation today in rethinking or reimagining the kind of contribution that MICTA might make in a post-COVID world, in, indeed not just in responding to COVID-19, but in recovery from it. Um, and to this end, I've been asked to comment on uh, my fellow panellist Emil's paper, and I have to say, I'm in complete agreement with your paper, Emil. I thought, you know, what you have done is given us a pathway, a, a model for thinking about what MICTA might take forward in the next couple of years with a particular focus on niche diplomacy through, health, through the lens of health governance. I thought that the approach that you've taken to actually justifying this idea looking at the inward and outward patterns of activity, uh, of compliance, of behaviour, is absolutely critical. And one of the things that I had noticed in going over the past seven years' worth of NICTA activity and dialogue, whether it was at a foreign minister level, at a senior official level, or at an academic level, uh, the, there is such an emphasis on very idealistic, lofty statements of commitment and shared values, but very little self-reflection 
on where each of these nations might be actually coming in to an issue from. And I think it's particularly important for us today in a world where national uh, and domestic priorities are often very blurred with our international activity and behaviours and priorities. We have to find a way to actually look both inwardly uh, and examine our priorities inwardly and our behaviours and outcomes and what that, that means and says about our international behaviours. So I think that's actually a model that could be taken forward in the MICTA process. It's something that we also see at play in the G20 process. And there is uh, excellent work done by the G20 research organisation to map and monitor compliance of G20 nations with the commitments that they uh, make through the Leaders' Summit each year. And I think that's something that we should be applying if NICTA is to move forward and to be practical uh, and to have impact on the ground. I would absolutely agree, and I think Emil was reflecting uh, the discussion from earlier in the day as well, that when you look at what MICTA has achieved, it is uneven, it is patchy, and impact and effectiveness is not particularly evident in any given field. Um, there are some good statements that have been made, but, but if you look at the activities, particularly around the edges of large multilateral fora, you know, it's, it's a very weak kind of contribution. And that could well be because of an agenda that is simply too unwieldy, that changes from year to year, and that is often driven from issue to issue. So by focusing in on a common issue of concern and global health uh, governance and security, I think, is one that is not just relevant but timely. Uh, where there are complementarities across the different nations, and I think Mel has, has demonstrated that, but there are also gaps uh, both in domestic and international behaviours. Where MICTA uh, may well have an opportunity to drive the agenda forward in a constructive way. And I would also agree that the G20 provides a a mechanism that each of the MICTA nations can contribute to, not just through the leaders of fora and through the different uh, task forces within that G20 structure, but also through those different engagement groups, whether that is civil society, business, uh, looking at women and looking at young people, all groups that have particular interests in how we handle health governance and security going forward. And some of those groups that are particularly vulnerable, and I'm thinking in particular about women, um, business in a small SME and micro capacity, and young people. Um, so in fact, potentially, rather than the UN, it is in the G20 that the MICTA coalition derives the greatest strength so if I were to add a couple of things to uh, this particular health governance agenda going forward, and, and nothing here is out of step with what Amel has put forward already, uh, potentially just to accentuate or, or highlight additional ideas, uh, I would suggest there's a real opportunity here to widen the dialogue beyond political leaders, uh, beyond senior officials that... Uh, tend to be in a very general capacity towards experts. Uh, academics in the international relations and diplomacy space, sure, but also experts in our science and health spaces as well. Potentially even also to, um, if we're thinking about global health governance, to looking at how hospitals, you know, where can we bring a dialogue between hospitals that are achieving outcomes on the ground as well so that they can share best practice and knowledge. And there are those networks, uh, particularly through the One Health Network, that exist that could really be developed. Secondly, I think looking to innovative collaborations um, Again, not just talking about what we're each doing in a research perspective, but actually looking to fund and drive forward collaborative research uh, and practice, again, focusing in on that health, hospital, community health space. Uh, and that could also incorporate an emphasis on, on vaccine development. And I thought the last intervention around vaccines is quite a critical and important one that should be uh, included in this discussion. Thirdly, 
again, to unlock and mobilise capital. Um, we often ask and look to governments to contribute funds uh, for capital investment. I think we should also be involving the private sector in these conversations and philanthropic organisations as well. And thinking creatively about how those funds might be um, might be utilised and invested for collaborative outcomes. And, and finally, to communicate outcomes more widely. One of the things that I think became very clear through the COVID pandemic is that our risk communication in times of pandemics is poor and uh, very fragmented. And we, we can actually develop much more coherent standards and practices within a WHO framework under the international health regulations to improve the kind of risk communication um, that is disseminated from the highest levels right out to grassroots communities. MICTA, with a focus on global health governance, could contribute to that space. Finally, just to conclude, um, I think this is an important agenda item, not just because it's timely and relevant now, but because MICTA is at a point in its existence where being able to demonstrate a track record, being able to demonstrate a common purpose and outcomes is critical to its ongoing existence. But I don't think it should stop there. And I think if, if we are able to strategize and cast forward, there is an opportunity to lift ambition. Human health cannot be considered in isolation. And the devastating and unprecedented impact of COVID-19 underscores the urgency for global cooperation, not just in this health space, but across social, economic and environmental challenges. Uh, so looking at how we might underpin human with planetary health could be something that MICTA might contribute to in the future. As governments shift from their response into a recovery mode and think about the opportunities for cooperation, we might think about the opportunity to deliver a double dividend outcome, maximising the investments that we're each making now into economic recovery to achieve better health outcomes, but also climate friendly, sustainable growth on local, regional and global scales. And the need for this has never been more compelling. Australia and Indonesia have some, some good uh, examples where they're operating together in some of these areas. I think that can easily be, be shared across the MICTA nations um, so that each is able to support the other through collaborative research, through capacity building and through shared examples of good practice. Working together through formal and informal diplomatic mechanisms, through public and traditional diplomacy, we should be looking to a longer term vision to lift ambitions right across the globe and to bring substance to the idea that someone mentioned much earlier around how we can go about building back better. So I'll leave it there and um, pass on back to the chair, Professor Choi. Okay, thank you for your comments. And the Professor Byrne actually argues that the, she actually agree with that the middle power has a lot of potential in promoting multilateral cooperation, but we need to focus on the, the issues of the compliance and the commitment. And then also she provided uh, proposed very useful suggestions for promoting multilateral cooperation by the mid powers. And uh, our last the discussant is the Professor Erika Riz Sandoval, a seed from Mexico, and then she will give the comments on both presentations. And could you start, please? Thank you very much, Professor Choi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I thank all the organizers uh, for having us meet even if it's through through Zoom, but it's always uh, worth it to exchange ideas. Um, I also have to say I, I, I have a, a close relationship with NICTA because I've worked with it from both an academic perspective and a public policy perspective. Um, the report in w by which we decided to participate in MICTA in Mexico uh, was basically written on my desk. And um, I was also a senior official for MICTA. So I do know both worlds. I know how we academics try and, and 
um, give attributes to these creations uh, in many ways and sometimes are frustrated by the fact that there's a capabilities expectations gap that we don't seem to understand. But I've also worked with it from the public policy perspective and I know it's hard uh, to move the car forward and, and convince people that this is a useful resource. Um, I have to say that COVID-19 uh, and as, I was, as we have seen through the discussions during the whole day, um, has basically revealed uh, many things about the world we live in that perhaps we knew deep, deep uh, down inside us, but we were not willing to acknowledge. Uh, I think at this point in time, it was as if we went through an x-ray machine and finally discovered that we have some tumors, some broken bones, and and some things lacking that we need to fix if we want to continue with our lives in terms of the general international community. Um, I think we also tend to say that we're all in this together. Um, yes, we are going through the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, even within MICTA, we're not in the same boat. I think uh, Professor Parler's tables are very revealing in terms of the differences uh, that the pandemic has created among our countries. Uh, the number of deceased people is definitely not comparable from Mexico to Korea, for example. I mean, Korea is talking about 300 something deaths, while we are, uh, the, the data for today is 72,000 dead people as acknowledged by the government. So we're in very different universes in that sense. Um, I think uh, we're depending perhaps too much on historical analogies and we're trying to find our way through these historical analogies, but we're going through a very new and different uh, era uh, and we're moving towards the unknown basically and that creates a lot of uncertainty and of fear. And fear is, is definitely a bad counselor for everybody, for policymakers, for academics, for researchers. Uh, we should try and prevent falling into, into the abyss of fear because that will not allow us to think clearly. The other danger I think, and, I've, and we've seen it through um, the discussions today, is that we're thinking from a static perspective. We're thinking that we're gonna come out of this the same way we entered it. Uh, that we are still gonna be middle powers, that we're still gonna be middle income countries that we're still going to be having that same space in the international scenario that we think we deserve or have, and that we don't know for sure. Because for many of our countries, uh, even within MICTA, the reality at the end will be very different, uh, at least for, from the predictions in terms of uh, GDP fall, in the case of Mexico, almost 12% this year, uh, the number of poor people that are going to enter that sector of the population is going to be huge. We're talking about 10 million in Mexico. So I think that positions us in a very different place from the one we had in 2013 when we started talking about MICTA. Um, I think also that with MICTA, we've taken a really long time to build MICTA. Uh, that is not a criticism, it's a fact. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble trying to define it. What is it? We just keep spelling it out. What's MICTA? Well, it's Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia. But we're still having trouble saying if it's a partnership, if it's, a, if it's an informal grouping, if it's a space. Uh, in Spanish, we call it a space, whatever that means. Uh, and it gives us a lot of trouble if we don't even know what we are and what we're here for. Um, Definitions also include that we are the bathroom break group from the G20. Uh, well, that's, that's okay, but we still need to do something else. And, and we've done a lot of soul searching, and I think we can see that through all the communiques and the statements we've published uh, as MICTA. I mean, we've talked about everything, terrorism, Ebola, um, you know, catastrophes, now COVID-19. We're trying to find our, our place and, and thinking about Global self-governance as a possible niche is a good idea. I think it, it, it's, it's the topic du jour. Uh, we definitely could find a place there. But we, all, we cannot forget that it's being geopoliticized. Uh, health it has become another tool of geopolitics. 
And we've seen it with the uh, vaccine, as Professor Choi uh, just explained, the rich countries are getting uh, a, a greater access to the vaccine uh, and, and all the others are trying to make an equitable and inclusive distribution of the vaccine because again, we're all going through the same storm, but we don't all have the same means to participate in a war for the vaccine or in a race for the vaccine. And, and although the multilateral solution seems obvious, seems logical, we should all work together to get this done or, or worked out the best way possible, uh, it doesn't seem to be politically feasible at this point in time. And I don't know if Mikta has the clout at this point in time to, to choose global health governance as the niche, uh, because all of a sudden it's not, it's not a, a soft issue or, or something where collaboration is obvious, but it has become weaponized in a sense. It has become part of the, of the clash between great powers of, of the race for more and more space within the international scene. Um, I think we've taken a long time, but I also think we've learned a lot from each other in terms of how to deal with each other. Um, it was mentioned by Professor Fitriani. Um, we, we didn't know each other. Mexico is really, really far away. I once had to travel to, to Indonesia and I discovered that uh, it was exactly on the opposite side of the world. It took the same amount of time to travel through the Atlantic or through the Pacific for me. Um, so it, we're definitely far away in that sense. And so we didn't know each other before. And now we're learning the ropes of how to deal with each other and what are our strengths and our weaknesses, etc. It also is important to remember what Professor Fitriani mentioned. We're not a priority for our governments uh, as MICTA. MICTA seems to be an afterthought many times. Uh, it's something that once we work with it, seems logical and seems useful, but it takes a lot of effort to, to get the wills together to actually think about MICTA and, and use it as a tool, as a resource, as, as, as something that increases our, our power, our voice, or gives us a, a better standing in the world. So I think at this, um, there are many writings these days about what the world after COVID-19 will be like. And I think we're seeing a huge return of politics. And in that sense, I think Mikta should also think about that. We need to learn to speak the language of politics. We need to figure out a way to be political in this world and to express our will and, and perhaps the will of other middle powers and of other regions that are just trying to be seen in the world today when we're going back to the, the whole great power clash. Uh, and as Professor Choi mentioned, the balance of power world again. Uh, we cannot play a role there. We were not going to balance one power against another. So we definitely need to find another space. Um, so in the end, I, I do believe that we should first start at home, start at MICTA. Let's improve ourselves before we decide to, to go and venture into the unknown with whatever niche we can find, we can work with together. Uh, I think the other logical niche, as Professor Perlar mentioned, is um, sustainable development, the environment, climate change. Uh, this is coming and it's coming strong to our own countries. Uh, so we definitely have something to do there and we've learned a lot of the pandemic. Now, I was just asking uh, a friend of mine in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, have the MICTA scientists met uh, to talk about COVID-19? Not yet. It's in the works, but not yet. Well, uh, I think it's high time they met. I think uh, we've done a lot of top-down MICTA. We need to do a lot more bottom-up MICTA and a lot more of connecting communities and exchanging experiences. If the scientists in MICTA have not met yet, that means we haven't learned from each other yet uh, useful lessons about the pandemic, how we've dealt with it, how we've made mistakes, or what are our good things in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Well, again, it's high time we started doing that first among the MICTA members, and then we can go and see if we have a place uh, in the world for us middle powers uh, to talk about important and relevant issues in the world to come. Thank you so much. Okay, Professor 
Professor Sandoval, and uh, Professor Sandoval mentioned that despite of the similar status among MiGTA countries, but there are still, you know, very, you know, big differences among the member states. Therefore, we consider these you know, differences more seriously and try to find a way to coordinate those differences. And thank you for your comments. And then now we will go back to the presenters. And then actually three discussants give a very important and useful comments on the two presentations. If two presenters has, you know, want to respond to those comments, please do so. But within uh, three minutes would be greatly appreciated. Yeah. Thank Dr. Fitriani? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Professor Choi. And thank you, Professor uh, Choi Hyun Jun, for commenting on my presentation. I, I think uh, your uh, comments are very, very useful to enhance more our understanding on the circumstances that are facing by MICTA at the moment, especially when you mentioned the uh, balance of power politics among major powers that really a uh, problem for us now in the era of uh, COVID-19. Uh, before COVID-19 era, it's already made difficult. But with this kind of circumstances, it's um, put us much more difficult situ uh, situ uh, situation. But your last uh, explanation about uh, WHO effort to pull resources of 170 countries to uh, for a kind of cooperation, multilateral cooperation to provide uh, a vaccine, I think is a kind of hopeful also for us. It's sure to us that actually, uh, yes, major power have a competition, but doesn't mean that we cannot do anything else apart from their competition. So, uh, and this effort by WHO on the uh, collaboration on the uh, vaccine, I think is one of the area that MITA can uh, uh, enhance its position. And I agree with uh, uh, Kathleen and uh, Dr. Uh, and, and Erica uh, that it is time for MICTA to show and to realize our potential. There is no better time. Perhaps this is the time uh, to, to show that MICTA is uh, relevant and it is useful. Uh, because uh, in this kind of circumstances, uh, MICTA has potential. And we can start uh, from collaboration on the vaccine, perhaps. Uh, collaboration on the providing uh, uh, a better uh, ideas on the global health governance uh, to go beyond vaccine. So to, to think our world beyond vaccine. But I think maybe in the short term, thinking about how can these five countries in MICTA can also Sorry, this is a Friday morning time, so it's very noisy in, in Jakarta and in Indonesia, as particularly. I think it's so. Uh, in this uh, COVID era, I think uh, MICTA can also uh, collaborate to push forward some some uh, some arrangement for a fair access and inclusive access for the vaccine. Maybe we should push uh, Minister of Health in its country, or maybe scholars on public health in each of our country to start to meet together. I can encourage my colleague from the Faculty of Public Health to, to, to get in touch, or maybe if we can facilitate them to get in touch and start discussion. Start discussion, how can, uh, because it is their area, public health, but maybe we can support them from behind, uh, start thinking about more possibility for, for these five countries to collaborate. And then later on, maybe uh, scholars like us in international relations can join them to discuss on uh, what we think uh, more fair and global governance uh, for the future. So just uh, the, the, my assessment is very much uh, start to pin down our macro uh, discussion to a more realistic or maybe possible step ahead for MICTA to show its relevance. So thank you again for all uh, panelists for your uh, commentary. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay.
Next, Dr. Paradar, do you have a, yeah. Actually, could you turn on the, Dr. Paradar, we cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think they, yeah, they did. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Caitlin and Erika for their fruitful comments uh, to my paper. And I fully share with their uh, suggestions, especially with Catherine's suggestion about, uh, um, about preparing compliance reports, perhaps, uh, I don't know, in two, two years ago when I was first invited to a MICTA uh, academic dialogue by an Indonesian uh, colleague working in the Minister of Indonesian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I had uh, written uh, in my email that perhaps we can think of uh, establishing a sort of uh, MICTA working group uh, and uh, trying to publish compliance reports as did uh, University of Toronto uh, as did uh, by university as, as uh, John Kirtan and his team are doing any uh, after uh, annual, each annual uh, submit. So I think it can be useful. It can be a useful tool in order to increase uh, the functionality of MICTA in the eyes of its members. Because I think the problem, uh, one of the biggest problem of MICTA is related with uh, the uh, with its uh, with the belonging of uh, with the problem related with. Uh, with the ideational problems, I think. For example, uh, I, I would like to uh, talk about a, a little bit talk about with Turkey's uh, uh, Turkish idea about Bikta. When I first uh, did my when I did my first research on Turkey's uh, position in Bikta and how Turkey look at Bikta, etc., I realized that uh, Turkey doesn't have a real middle power identity. So perhaps this is why Turkey has. Uh, adopted a lower stance against MIGTA. So this kind of socialization, socialization problems exist among members. So uh, MIGTA, please, uh, as scholars, we must accept uh, MIGTA as an evolving structure, as an evolving grouping. So uh, socialization is still uh, ongoing. So uh, while uh, looking at MIGTA's policies or while considering MIGTA's deficiencies, and potentialities, we must always take into account this uh, ongoing socialization process. It is an evolving structure. Um, I think uh, this is a very uh, important uh, proposition. Uh, compliance reports can increase uh, members, MICTA members' uh, understanding of, of MICTA. And perhaps this can help them push themselves uh, to comply with their own commitments uh, down in the at the annual submits or at the foreign ministers' uh, meetings, uh, etc. Uh, another uh, comment which was very interesting uh, was uh, Erika's comment regarding uh, regarding the different uh, possibilities, the different uh, uh, stories of each MICTA member. I think you are right. Each MICTA member has different uh, story, has has uh, different trajectories. Uh, but this pandemic can create a uh, good opportunity for uh, MICTA members to create a common ground and to take common positions against a common problem, which is uh, pandemic. Now we are at the stage of, uh, we are at the, we are not at the, at the initial stage of uh, the uh, pandemic outbreak. So uh, during the distribution of vaccine and during the uh, research on vaccine, uh, perhaps this common space can be uh, functionalized and can be much more uh, oper operationalized uh, among members. Uh, another important topic regarding MICTA's future uh, policies is, uh, as I stated in my uh, presentation, perhaps I, I forgot, I couldn't uh, go into details about this topic, is about MICTA's possible role in a global, in a, uh, global health assistance. I think it is very important if uh, MICTA members can uh, act collectively uh, in uh, development cooperation, especially in the field of health sector. Uh, this can be. Uh, this can also improve uh, MICTA status because, as you know, most of the uh, MICTA members are important donors in the international development sector. So if they can come together and they can. Uh, 
collaborate uh, to give a common response to uh, the third countries, to the least developed countries, and to create a loan or I don't know what kind of structure, what kind of framework they can uh, create. Uh, this can also be uh, very useful uh, for uh, raising uh, MICTAS visibility and impact. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. And then now actually we have only five minutes left, but the, the online audience sent us uh, many interesting questions. So I actually selected a couple of them, but since we don't have uh, enough time to cover all the questions, I actually would like to pick up one very simple and you know, very strong questions. So the question is, that what would be the most urgent task for this MICTA cooperation in terms of the, the health you know, governance? And then the second, you know, it's kind of the same question, and the, what kind of, you know, what is the most important values this MICTA cooperation should pursue? So my question is what is the most urgent task, and then what, what kind of the, you know, values that these MICTA countries should pursue for their multilateral cooperation? The, you know, this question is open for the every panelist. So any volunteer? Okay. Can I, oh, go ahead. Can, can, I, can I try to answer the first question? I think maybe cooperation uh, to, if we do not produce, but at least we uh, uh, distribute a vaccine for, for all, uh, uh, for at least we collaborate to, to, to prove that NICTA is useful and relevant. Collaborate in vaccine, uh, not maybe product uh, can also distribution or uh, research uh, is also still possible because what vaccine doing now is making under pressure and maybe it's not a perfect so maybe Mikta can slowly develop a better vaccine by start collaboration I think it's to prove that our our relevance this maybe for the first question thank you Maybe I'll jump in as well now. Oh, sorry, Professor Choi, were you speaking? Okay. Um, I, I wonder if there's an opportunity for MICTA nations to fairly urgently share experiences on test and tracing. One of the things I thought was so interesting is the very different experiences uh, that have occurred across the different MICTA countries, and yet, we have also all had spikes in outbreaks in different parts and we've responded to those differently. Uh, so I think we can learn a lot from each other just in how we've been managing uh, the testing and tracing process and how that has helped to suppress uh, the pandemic in communities. The other area I would say we need to urgently uh, talk about further is the impact of COVID-19 on women, uh, whether that relates to women in healthcare, women uh, in the workforce, and women um, experiencing more domestic violence. We know that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact on women in all of those domains, and we should be doing more to actually address that. Uh, I think that will be a key issue for the G20, hopefully. Uh, going forward, then that's something we could potentially get some traction on. Okay, thank you. And actually, time's up. So this is all for this session. And I would like to thank you all the panelists and audiences for their active participation. And I hope all of us, all of you, can stay healthy and strong. And thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Great to meet you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for thank you all for sharing your knowledge and views with us today. For the wrap up, I would like to invite Professor Sangwan Lee again to the stage. Please welcome him again. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it it passed midnight uh, in Mexico. I think so. Uh, anyway, the, uh, thank you very much for staying on the line until now. Uh, today, today it's, it, it's time. It's time to wrap up today's sessions uh, shortly. Uh, today we deal with 
uh, post COVID 19 global uh, order and MECTAS role as a middle power partnership. All presenters and the panelists expressed both expectation and uh, concern for the future of MICTA. They are worried about the globalization, trade protectionism, weakening of democratic norms and practices, challenges to multilateralism, economic recession, and its related governmental budget squeeze in global communities of a post-COVID-19 period. Uh, this morning, uh, as Professor Jeffrey Robertson from Australia mentioned, most importantly, COVID-19 has tightened foreign ministry budget uh, across the world. The capacity to support the multiple programs in MICTA will come under increasing pressures and MICTA will face the budget squeeze risk. However, I hope and the, I believe that the uh, middle power initiatives like MICTA are not going to fade out on stages of global governance in the near future. On the other hand, the professor just before Abi Pitriani from Indonesia pointed out that major countries create magnitude of challenges to multilateralism. Nevertheless, the pandemic and the crisis can be overcome by multilateral cooperation. I agree. MICTA has potentials to be an alternative coalition to promote multilateral cooperation, especially build on inclusive global health governance, even if MICTA has collective weaknesses to materialize its promises. And uh, Professor Emel Dar from Turkey uh, proposed the creation of a fund similar to the BRICS emergency assistance loan. It is a meaningful suggestion, I think. In order to be an influential actor in the eyes of the global public opinion, more importantly, I agree, MICTA members must work harder so that COVID-19 policies would not result in both the weakening of democratic norms and practices and the strengthening of authoritarian politics in their own countries and elsewhere. Finally, uh, I would like to uh, my, uh, I would like to replace my laptop with uh, Professor Joji Chabon's arguments in his paper. In order for MICTA countries to serve as uh, mid uh, middle, regional, and constructive powers, they needed to consolidate the support of all relevant state and non-state actors in their countries, allowing MICTA to become a relevant mechanism to promote and generate public goods in the international system, in particular, in times of international sanitary crisis like COVID-19 and its economic effects. Thank you very much. Uh, take care, stay strong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Lee. Uh, so it's almost the end of MICTA academic dialogue. Uh, we have last one the, for concluding remarks. Uh, Jae Bok Jang, the ambassador and deputy minister for public diplomacy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in South Korea, will deliver the concluding remarks. Hola, selamat siang. 안녕하세요. Merhaba. Good day. I believe that today's MICTA academic dialogue, though held virtually, allows us to have such fruitful and productive discussions despite various locations and time difference. Following your excellent presentations and active discussions today, I'd like to quote famous writer William Wordsworth, saying, I quote, Wisdom is oftentimes nearer when you stoop than we soar. In particular, in the midst of ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, 
It is much meaningful for scholars and experts from MICTA member states to share views on post-COVID-19 global orders and seek for ways to strengthen multilateralism and global health cooperation to overcome this pandemic. MICTA is also a valuable public diplomacy platform to enhance mutual understandings and exchanges among five countries from diverse cultures and regions. Therefore, I wish that MICTA academic dialogue that we have held today would infuse new creative energy to revitalize and enrich academic exchanges among MICTA member states to extend the scope of MICTA partnership. Last but not least, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to the distinguished presenters, panelists, and moderators, as well as participants around the world. Gracias, Trima Kash, Kamsamida, Teshe Kuraderim, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador Chang. So this is all we have today. I would, like, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to all participants and audiences. Thanks a lot uh, once again for watching the dialogue today. Hope to see you again soon.